Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Snapshot episode 66. I'm Brennan Patrick, joined by Marvel Snap Phenom Glenn Jones. Glenn Jones, principal game designer of Marvel Snap. Welcome back to the podcast. It's great to have you. A lot has happened since we last had you on the podcast. Just want to get get updates from you. What's going on? How you doing? Et cetera. Sure. I mean, can't complain. Things are pretty much the same uh, on our side. We're continuing to work on more features. Uh, it's got a lot of great stuff in the pipeline. Just saw actually some of the more exciting things I've seen uh, in a while uh, at a presentation last week. So yeah, pretty stoked. Yeah, it's super interesting to watch uh, Marvel Snap go through the life cycle, starting to mature as a game. I mean, we were probably we were kind of at that state when you came on um, last time on the podcast, but now we're really entering that phase as you guys hit one year, one year plus, and we get to see sort of the the bigger and grand vision of the game. I know as a player, it's been very rewarding to uh, play it since since global release and now get access to the much larger card pool, the multiple game modes. Um, Etc. I'm super excited for the future game mode as well, which has been hinted at, but we don't know what it is quite yet. Okay, I want to give you a chance to, um, I mean, anything you want to pop in with before we head into the Bend and Snap section. We had a, a bunch of questions come in from our listeners on YouTube, so we really appreciate that. And this episode will be a lot of your questions being answered, actually. I guess I wanted to touch on two things. One is where specifically you came into the design cycle, and the second one is what your responsibilities are with regards to like, I feel like you are sort of regarded as people, people will ask questions and expect you to answer them. Like, what is it that you can actually control? Cause I know you get questions on a wide range of things that you can't mm -hmm. control. So what is it we should be effectively badgering you about and what should we, you know, direct elsewhere, right? What is, sure. what is a question you can answer? Uh, it's a mix of, questions there uh so i mean i'm the principal game designer for marvel snap uh why my actual role within like the snap team uh, is essentially that i'm the gameplay content lead uh so i'm responsible for like generating the i uh, the themes for seasons like going through that iteration with pro with the process and building everyone that's not to say i like do that all on my own but like i'm uh, uh one of the leaders in making in progressing something from like there's nothing here to now we have an idea for like what to do for a season uh, you know, selecting the cards, getting those assigned to the art team so that they can begin commissioning it, um, pitching some variants, things like that. We do that as well. Uh, and then, of course, like designing the cards, uh, iterating through those designs and eventually moving them all the way through to final balance and shipping them out the door. Uh, along the way, like I consult on a lot of other teams for things that are like kind of adjacent to that pipeline. Uh, like feature development, I'm a play tester for like any new feature that we release, uh, like the game mode Brendan just alluded to, uh, as well as you know we've talked about the uh, upcoming uh, feature league like uh, feature with clans, I guess is the shorthand we've used. Uh, we did a poll on teams and alliances about it, for example, uh, and we have that uh, in motion, and I've played with that uh, among other features. So yeah, like I I participate in a lot of things, uh, including that yeah, product as well, like talking about cards and. Uh, where we see releasing them best, like the order in which we want to release them. Uh, but that's like outside of my actual purview. That's more just, you know, I'm kind of a consultant uh, when it comes to stuff for product. Right. Like specifically what I wanted to drill down on is the connection between the product team, like the marketing, the pricing, mm -hmm. all of that, and you, the design team, and how that's being facilitated and if anything has changed along those lines. Because one of the things that I felt like I noticed in previous series and you can obviously correct me you would have a better idea than i did was it felt like things were happening uh as if the two hemispheres of the brain weren't exactly communicating with each other whether or not that was you know just they were and it just didn't work out or they weren't and whatever Do you, could you shed any light on things like you know changes to a card and then that card not being in a spotlight cache like the gladiator change coming when it was just like two months from being in a spotlight cache people couldn't reasonably acquire it it was just very good uh, the Elsa change as well sort of falls along this line. What yeah, the connection level there. So we're we're quite connected. We talk weekly, uh, sometimes more often uh, about those things. So there's definitely no like disconnect, like purposeful disconnect uh, going on in that regard. Uh, so we're, we're considered. I consider it a partnership. Like they have the things that they have authority over. We have the things we have authority over, and then we you know give ideas to each side about what we think. Uh, you know, I get, I certainly get balance uh, conversations and ideas about, you know, is this season pass card exciting enough, things like that from the product team, which is much appreciated. Like that's great feedback. Love that. Uh, so as far as like those specific examples, like sometimes it's just like, 
that's how it goes. Like Gladiator's a fine example where it's like, yeah, we realized we needed like one more power to really get this card where we wanted. That's just how it went. We had an opportunity to add it later. We've kind of debated a little bit in the wake of changes like that. It's like, I mean, is it correct to like just wait until Gladiator's in a spotlight cache later to give him the power? That feels weird. Uh, we'd rather just make the card cool and make sure that all the people who were excited to play with them get rewarded for their choice. Like we want to make it so that you're not afraid a card is going to not work out. Like we want to instill confidence that like when we release a card, we expect it to be good. If it winds up not being good, we're going to make it good. Uh, it will, it will have its day. Um, so, and then Elsa Bloodstone is a different case where that one, like we knew we wanted to make the change that we wanted to make. We actually had it lined up to release, uh, alongside her spotlight cache. That was coming up, but we ran into some technical issues and had to delay her to a patch, which was just not desirable. Like that, that wasn't our plan either. Uh, but you know, ultimately, it's just how it went. And that's you know, not, we hope to not have that happen. We try and button up as best we can. But uh, the live content treadmill does have the occasional rock in the street. Uh, so yeah, there is one thing you said there that I really want to jump off of, which is when the when you release a card, you want people who purchased it to know that, like, you know, you are interested in making that card good. You are interested in making that card appealing. I'm just one word question, martyr question mark. Yeah, that one is just a weird card. I mean, we did buff martyr like yeah. quite quickly afterwards. Uh, but, you know, as we have all, I think, seen like that buff's not quite there. I mean, it did help. Like martyr is not uh, the worst card. I'm not even sure she's in the bottom 10. I don't think she is. Good for her. Um, but yeah, like there's some stuff going on there. I have ideas about maybe changing Martyr more significantly long term. Maybe not. Kind of just see how those that stuff winds up shaking out. It's not a really high priority to like address her, but it is a priority uh, certainly. And it depends on the situation. Like Gladiator was just one where it was like, yeah, we have the read here. We we were just that much off. We can make that change quick and easy and clean. And we tried something similar with Martyr. And it's like, okay, we were more than a power off. Like maybe there's a larger issue that we have to contend with here. And I'm not going to just keep adding one power to the card every two weeks until people start playing it enough. Uh, that's not a super effective way to ba balance cards. So yeah, that's when, whenever like the clean, easy fix doesn't seem like the right fix. That's when we'll tend to take our time with something and try and make sure that whatever we do is like actually cool and good. Not just, oh, let's just try something like we don't, we don't want to where we consider ourselves stewards of, of the game and the cards. So it's important to us that when we make changes, especially if they actually change the functionality of the card, that we think we're leaving players with something that is still fun that they can enjoy and long term is going to be a better option for them versus they have to expect it to change again in like the near future. Then I've got one more and Brent, Brendan, I'm I'm very sorry for doing this. No, you didn't tell me I could do it. This I'm is this it. is the content. Uh, <laughs> Send it. Okay, I've got one more based on that. Is there anything you regret that can be like not changing a card fast enough or not doing this implementation along these lines, like of a card that's come out. Is there something you came up with afterwards? Like a, like a moment of like, Oh, we really should have um, done that. That you're like, oh, I wish I'd done that for. And if you're allowed to say, of course. Yeah, there definitely are. Uh, I'm like, don't have one prepped in my head uh, offhand because most of those are like the cards that haven't released yet but are too late for me to change now. Uh, those are the ones that I find <laughs> myself focusing on more. Uh, so like ones that came out and then like I was like, oh, we could have done that better later. Hmm. I mean, Meek is probably a good example. Like we just mm. executed Meek quite poorly, I think. Uh, and part of it was I actually just didn't think about the functional change. Like the way we, Meek works now was just in a version of his functionality I had not considered, uh, like creating a passive staging move uh, on the next turn. It's kind of an unusual structure, but it's like totally technologically viable. It was just not something that we hit as we were iterating through the card um, for you know, a couple of reasons. And uh, yeah, really happy to have found it, but certainly like I figured it out, I think like a week after it released was when I came up with the fix for Meek, and I was just like, ah, oh, rats, like that. I should have yeah. just gotten that right. Yeah. All right. On to our listener question section, our Ben the Snap section per se. If you want to get your question read out in next week's podcast, we will not have Glenn on, but you can choose to come on and use it. <laughs> First one is from Canadian Bacon. They say, when contrasting your work on Snap to your previous work on Magic at Wizards, are your goals very similar or are they different philosophies slash goals in how you approach card design and the balance uh, the balance between the two? Sure. It's a pretty simple question. Uh, the products are very different, right? So like Magic has uh, a release cadence. They release large collections of cards periodically, like every two to three months. 
uh each time it's like kind of an event they make a big deal out of that there's it's almost like a it's almost like its own little game like they are expansions like a lot of people are used to playing expansion content like in isolation magic's not a game where you do that like you often immediately integrate whatever you're getting into the stuff that you already had and continue playing with it but it still has that vibe of like there's this new kind of little world of cards to explore and that's what consumes people's attention for the the weeks after the set's release Snap doesn't do that at all. Uh, uh, we have seasons, which, like, on the face of them, maybe seem kind of like expansions, but they really aren't at all. The magic sets are a bunch of related pieces that are codependent on one another, and they get developed for a long time immediately next to one another, and there's, like, a lot of dependency and a lot of uh, joy that can be extracted from the experience releasing simultaneously, where Snap is uh, premised on we have a card every week. Like we need each of our cards to stand alone to be an exciting addition to the game. It's something that some something that someone will be excited to own uh, and find enjoyable. So we have to view each card kind of as its own product in a sense. Like each card is its own magic set. Like that's what we're looking for. It's like a much smaller scale, but we want people to it to come out. People see it, get excited, uh, play with it, and then be hyped for the next one. And, and we just keep rolling. Uh, so it does affect some of our changes. Like one of the things, for example, like magic makes a lot of really charming commons and uncommons. Like that's just not something our game is like super well positioned to do. It's not something philosophically we're like seeking, you know, I don't think anyone's looking for shield agent to the card, like just blank shield agent vanilla. Um, but that is something that people look for in magic. Like that's a, a key part of the experience is what is adding the flavor and building the world around them with the card content. Uh, so it's just a little bit different for us in that regard. We have to push a little bit harder on cards that feel uh, really impactful. That I mean, from in Magic parlance, like you know, we print a lot of Mythic rares ma and Magic prints. You know, a lot of cards up and down the their rarity chain with a lot of different ways in which those cards can be appreciated. Have y'all ever considered moving to a batch release schedule? Not not necessarily a week uh, away from the sort of week to week release, but have you considered having uh, whether it's a start of every month? And I know we did switch over to the season pass releasing with a new card on the same day, but have you thought about in the future moving to a content release schedule that had sort of mini expansions in a way, like multiple cards releasing on the same day? Not really. I mean, I'm sure that the team before I came like thought a lot about that because it would have certainly been one of the primary questions they had to answer. Uh, but as is, the game is very much premised around its current release structure, and we believe that that structure is good. Like providing people with something new to get excited about every Tuesday is you know really really unique in the in the space. Uh, and we think that that's to our benefit. So we're we're structured to help it. That's not to say like you know I would like to be able to print the occasional like interesting card in a different way uh and yeah maybe we'll find some ways to do that because certainly i don't expect to put you know like a we we joke in, inside like our, our lingos is like iron elbow like just iron fist that moves a card to the right like we're not gonna make that a series five card right like everyone everyone is gonna be like what are you doing like i have iron fist that's an insane thing to put in the series five store um but like that doesn't mean we should never make iron elbow that's a cool card to make like some people could enjoy the having the option on, on which one they put pick uh, so, you know, maybe we'll develop a, a model for the game that allows us to do that. Yeah, I feel like Snap very, uh, very much innovated in Trailblaze, a sort of re re weekly release cadence, um, especially in your consistency and your ability to keep up with the speed. Do you think that that is probably the fastest cadence possible in terms of development and everything that goes into making a new card? Because um, it seems like it has, at least from the outside, it doesn't seem like it's giving you all a lot of trouble so far. It seems like it's going very well. We get new and interesting, flavorful cards every single week. Can you talk a little bit about like the process on the back end and how hard it is to create cards every single week that people are interested in want to engage with and i guess at the end of the day also want to purchase i'm glad that it looks easy uh it is definitely not easy <laughs> you made a face when you said that and i was like i don't think so man that's why i said it's that's why super I hard from yeah. the outside <laughs> yeah it's super hard i consider what i do now like from like a just total sum of work like much more difficult than uh, what I was doing leading magic sets, uh, which I really enjoyed. And I still, re I really enjoy making snap as well. Uh, but yeah, it is, it is very difficult. There's a lot of moving parts. Uh, the biggest thing that's going on really is you're both, you know, in the factory and also like at retail kind of, right? Like we're, we're constantly putting something out and, uh, and addressing that in addition to making all the things that will come next. So we're both the, the treadmill and the treadmill factory, uh, which is a weird kind of spot to be in. Uh, and yeah, it makes it, that's where I think a lot of it comes from is like, while I'm balancing the cards that are going to release in a month, I'm also 
building the cards that will release in like four months uh, from the ground up. So like, that's like roughly kind of, let's say probably a wider range than that. And so, and then everything in between those two points is also in active development, right? Like at any given time, we're working on a lot. So for example, right now I have just started working on December's season. Like we're at the very earliest stages of it. Um, so that gives you an idea of like everything else from December forward is still in some form of development. Uh, yeah, that's a um, real, I saw, sorry. Yeah, I saw, I saw you want to go game. Go ahead. Because like the timeline thing is fascinating, mm -hmm. right? Because it's like, you're making these balance changes. You're doing like, okay, we're gonna make a card right and that card is coming out in march and you're testing that card for coming out in march in december and in december there's like a completely different context for what deck that card will go in but then something gets ota and you did that ota but you don't exactly know how it's going to affect the meta how do you manage those multiple timelines yeah a lot of that is definitely you know, intuition, maybe a combination of math. I've, I will build out some models to kind of let me figure out uh, what I think might be the actual outcome of something or how substantial an impact is. Um, and that kind of helps us intuit what will happen. And certainly sometimes maybe we'll make a change and then we'll go back and look at a future season and like, oh, this change is actually going to really mess up what we were expecting this card to do. Do we need to update this card or change what it's supposed to be about because we you know deleted its best friend or whatever uh obviously we don't do that that often so it's not that hard to avoid but that's par also part of why i've talked about in the past when we do have to rebalance cards we try and keep their identities intact because that's one of the ways we protect ourselves from making our new content invalid with previous content is that if you know we just change something all the way uh then how do you make it like line up like you're gonna just have a house of cards basically so that's not there's not every card is a problem. Like crystals are fine example. It's like, you know, we didn't have a lot of late designs dependent on crystal, so we could really kind of do whatever we wanted with her. But we still have a, a philosophy of like, yeah, there's still just this card is about drawing a card, like in it, and we kind of want to keep that piece of the identity intact because for the people who also just happened to like it, uh, like that's part of what they liked. So why would we change it to something that's a total departure from that? Right. You I just mean like in terms of like when the OTA balance is so focused around, you know, balance outliers high a lot of the time. And I'm not saying that like that's all that goes into OTAs, because actually, I think if you looked on volume, more OTAs than not just looking at like the total changes went to underperforming cards getting buffed yeah. or I think on volume that is true. But Probably the ones close, we remember, yeah. the ones that impact things, because obviously they, they are the impactful ones, are the ones that are big nerfs or even moderate nerfs to good to great decks. When you're doing those, how forward thinking are you when doing them? Or is it purely in the moment because that's what the OTA has to be? Yeah, I mean, we try to be forward thinking, but certainly, you know, we're humans. Uh, we don't have like a, a really easy system structured uh, to allow us to just predict how everything will go out. So it's a lot of intuition, a lot of us just remembering what mattered to what, you know, and it's very easy for us to have just you know, totally, totally missed something that could, could happen. I can't think of a specific instance where I'm like, yeah, we totally forgot that we OTA'd out something that like would have been good with this. But I mean, like an example might've been, um, I don't know, like if we had printed like a five cost card that puts rocks into your opponent's deck and then we OTA Darkhawk to five, four, like, Oh, that kind of doesn't like we're that now they're now they're fighting like that. Whoops, yeah. we shouldn't have done that. Um, so like we didn't, but that's the kind of thing that I think we would be looking out for basically. Uh, and it doesn't actually, it doesn't actually come up that often. Uh, it's just a difficult thing to have it come up in the first place. In part because we're also trying to drive cards towards like new areas, new decks, new combinations. So so it's in, less in, less worrisome. In the context of new areas, new decks, new cards occupying new spaces, I guess. I'm just going to bring up Thanos then because mm -hmm. that guy to me feels like he occupies more design space than literally anybody. Like he goes with a bunch of stuff and not only does he go with a bunch of stuff, there are these niche ish cards that explore niche design spaces that incidentally get pushed to the moon because he just happens to be in that niche too. Right. Mockingbird is the example of this that comes to mind most obviously. But I think the best example right now is actually probably Blob, who is like benefiting from the niche of having a lot of cards in your deck, which is just yeah. a crazy niche for any card to benefit from. But that's what he's doing. Right. 
like Call Obsidian is like this. It's just like Thanos is probably like the best mono one drops deck. Uh, Mockingbird again, like that's like a shield card, but it the stones are like that. Capital L, capital T on like that. So, what is it about that? Like, would you say? I guess is it fair to describe him as? People often used to ask, like, oh, doesn't Mr. Negative limit design space? You know, and you you answered that with, uh, no, not really. This is a cool card. We like it. And it's not really limiting design space in that way. Thanos, does Thanos limit design space? Yeah, I don't think in the same way. I would, I'm not sure I would describe it exactly as limiting design space, but certainly, I mean, the Mr. Negative one we can break down fairly easily. Like, Mr. Negative decks are just premised around drawing Mr. Negative, right? Yeah. So the there are two ways that you can, like, actually buff their decks and it's not releasing more zero power cards like that's just the value above replacements is fairly low uh the the solutions are you can make them more likely to draw mr negative or you can release a card like ravona who maybe you know scratches some of what mr negative is itching at uh when you're playing the deck so you still have a way to maybe win the game if you don't draw those are like basically the two ways that you could buff the deck so as long as we don't do those too much we don't really have to worry about mr negative um thanos is a different problem because he's not one card he's seven cards and his deck is not premised around drawing any particular one of them. Certainly, it's stronger when you draw the Mind Stone. Uh, but they're all pretty good. And they are supposed to be good. Like, you're supposed to be happy to draw those cards. Otherwise, what are we doing here? You know, uh, so that's a tricky element of it in that Thanos is, like, as a deck designed to kind of be a little bit more open-ended. Because if he wasn't, it would be really tricky to make that true. Like, the stones, the narrower they get, the harder it is to like make an interesting like Thanos deck to some extent. Uh, that said, like yeah, it, it is a meaningful limitation. Like, things like Call Obsidian are purposeful. Like that card is supposed to feel good in a Thanos deck. That's narratively cohesive. Uh, and then things like Mockingbird are are incidental. We're like yeah, yeah, that's just how it goes. Like some of the some of the things will work out. And we don't try and actively avoid uh, things like that. Like in general, whenever you find emergent gameplay in your development, you should be like dope. Cool. Like, let's make sure that stays. Uh, and so, some, you so know, you're saying you're saying no, putting text on Mockingbird. No. That says, like, you, you won't let me do the text. You won't. So let the, me, you, ah, I love this no. pitch. It's the greatest pitch of all time. I will. I will say the the premise is not invalid. Like, if the pro, if like it's like okay, Mockingbird would be fine to print, except that Thanos is a problem. But the solution right. to that isn't put some really weird text onto Mockingbird. The solution to that is just redesign Mockingbird, or I mean, like maybe redesign Thanos. But that's that's like that's. A lot of that's actually a, a interesting design topic to talk about uh, because it is very often a design instinct for people when like they bump into a problem, they're like, "All right, break out the duct tape, solve that problem." Yes. They bump into the next problem, "All right, break out the duct tape," and then you get to the end, and you're like, "I can barely even see what is inside all of this duct tape." Uh, and it also is just an in inelegant solution, and it's also just going to bump into something else later. Like, do you think we're never going to make another Thanos type card that shuffles cards into your deck at the start of the game? Like. No, we probably are. So, what are we going to do with Mockingbird then? Just like add another card to it? Like it's, this doesn't work not with a... that either. Okay, <laughs> I'm going to make it the longest card in Marvel yeah. Snap history. You should hire me. I'm a genius. Uh, no, but like that is like a really yeah. it's like a thing. Like, like I, I make jokes about that, right? Like I understand why it's a bad idea. I get it. I do. But is there ever any consideration towards just like short term? This sucks. Throw it on there. We'll fix it later. Or is that just not even something like, are you worried that like duct tape accumulates it's like duct tape, you know, you don't want it to be the thing holding your car together for a month, but it can hold you together long enough to get to the dealership or the yeah, you know, sure. wherever you need to go in order to fix it. Right. Like, is there ever yeah. a consideration for that? I'm definitely talking about it more in that in the previous context of like uh, in the design cycle, like you wouldn't just do that during actual design. I think you're talking about it more in like the OTA patch cycle or maybe like toss something in there to, just relieve metagame pressure maybe yeah. for a little bit. Uh, we have talked about doing things like that. In general, I'm not a super big fan. Uh, I take it pretty seriously when we change a card. Uh, that I know some people may not believe that, but yeah. Uh, I think that <laughs> changing cards is, you know, we, we gave you something. Like, that's yours. You enjoy it. Like, there are people who love it. There are people who are splitting it, you know, like 20 times or whatever, because that's their experience and, that, and a part of the game that they're truly connected to. So I don't want to have them have to check like every two weeks, like, oh, did my card change? Did my card change? Like, I don't want that to feel like a, a really loud pressure on them, which mm. when we were, if we're willing to make more cavalier changes, that would just kind of inevitably be true that like they have to worry about things changing a little bit more frequently. Uh, so we, we prefer more stability than that. I really don't like to make people have to constantly memorize what a card does again. It's not, it's not a super fun part of the gaming experience. So I'd much rather solve the problem correctly in one swing um that said 
every now and then we're going to do something like that. I'm sure. Uh, I in fact know for uh, for certainty we have one in the in the future plans. And then there's stuff like what we've done with Adam Warlock recently, where we don't have a solution for Adam Warlock like cooked up yet. But also it's not that meaningful because he wasn't really doing anything. Uh, so we're like, all right, well let's see how would the effective performed at this cost like. Are there things to be done that are concerning with this interaction? Like, it's not even about is that does Adam Warlock become strong now? It's about like, all right, if we gave Dex the ability to theoretically like draw a card with a body on turn five, like, does that make something else more interesting? Like, we can look into the data and go and see like which cards had you know a, a three percent increase in win rate between Adam's OTAs. Like, that's something that I can then draw conclusions on and based and use to for future design work. Uh, and then you know eventually we'll get around to fixing Adam, assuming that we still need to, which I think that's kind of his indicative of the case. It doesn't seem like Adam Warlock's structure is uh, super, super great for what we're trying to hopefully do with Snap in general, but I don't know, maybe, maybe we'll give it one more go before we uh, rework, rework him completely. He's 5'6 now. You heard it here first. We're 5'6. <laughs> it's going to be great. It's gonna work I don't this think time, that's the I direction promise. I would go. <laughs> I promise it's going to work this time. Uh, I, I actually do have one Adam Warlock question. It's uh, a lot of people, and I, I personally don't believe this, have been saying, you know, oh, they nerfed him. He's worse now than he was at 2-0. No, he's not worse. Okay. He is, <laughs> I think, I don't have it, like, memorized, but I've checked, I do check the data from time to time, and I believe at one, at least one of the checks I made, he was, like, 7% better, which is a lot. Uh, but he was also really bad. So. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, like, I, I was fairly certain that he got better. I, I know you caught some flack on social media. I don't know if you know you caught some flack on social media for responding to like a two paragraph question about Adam Warlock with cards with power are typically better than cards without power. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it, maybe that's the same Kevlar, but it is true. And it is very yeah. easy for people to underestimate. Uh, similarly, in Snap specifically, uh, like card costing, people are very like, you know, a one energy is like a huge deal. But relative to games like, you know, Magic or Root or these other games, like it's a little bit less of a deal because of our constrained nature of turns. Like you're only going to get to play, you have six turns and you're only going to get to play 12 cards, like roughly, you know, depending on what's going on. So an energy here and there, like sometimes really isn't that impactful on a card if you're, you still have to draw it, like you had to do something else. Like, um, the example I gave with the Darkhawk deck, for example, like that five cost rock oh, shuffler, yeah. like if that card was a five or a six cost, it's basically the same in the new Darkhawk deck, right? Because there's a Darkhawk you're playing on five. And if you don't, you play this guy and then you draw the Darkhawk, you play him on six. And so they feel very similar at five and six cost. You just stat them a little bit differently, but it's not a massive swing in their, in their strengths necessarily. I'm not saying the card's good. I'm just implying that the disparity between five and six would be fairly low. Um, and it varies a little bit at cost. Like we've certainly seen two and three costs as a big jump for sure uh, within our game system. And like one and three is obviously like a very large gap. But yeah, the higher you go, the less true it is because the opportunity cost to play those cards was already so compressed. There's only six turns in the game that the fact that it costs less energy is much less meaningful because you you can only do so much within the space that it could have ever been played in. Yeah, like it, it's it's opportunity cost, not just in terms of compressed in terms of time span to play it but also in terms of slots in the deck because yes. you can only fit so many big things in there right and like they're not that far off from each other we've seen thanos go from a five drop deck to a six drop deck and it was more or less looking similarly in terms of how it played just you know ramping a turn later right and that is the same thing like it's just the biggest body is the most effective way to get them out right it, there's a limited amount you can put in any deck yeah, I think that I think that Thanos is a, an excellent example there. Where yeah, fives and sixes are roughly the same to him. It just depends on what you're structuring your deck around the curve doing. Yep, and and that is like a just such an odd thing to like try to wrap your head around because there yeah. are like actually a ton of great sixes in this game, but, but only a few of them really get yeah. there. To return to the, the question a little bit, which was like, yeah, like power, people really do underestimate how much like one power is worth or especially zero, like zero and one is a really large change mm -hmm. in the amount of power that it adds. It's the, technically the largest change in the game, in the game, essentially, like it's just a big going from absolutely nothing to yeah. being able to win the game. Um, and I, you know, I, I teach design use chess as an example, like there's a really big difference between a piece that can checkmate a king with just a king and a piece that can't. And it's a very, it might seem like a very small difference, but it's actually quite large. Like that's the, in its way, the difference between like a bishop and a rook, like a bishop cannot checkmate a king with a king, but a rook can. Um, 
Interesting. You mentioned um, that you were just starting the design on December. Can you give us a little bit of insight on what that looks like this far out? You don't have to tell us a theme or anything like that, but what nope, is the... Yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> I want to know, like, the, yeah, I just uh, want to kind of know, like, the initial process, like, the ideation, like, how it goes through um, for you, someone designing months and months and months in advance, if it's yeah, appropriate. Sure, I can, I can answer that. Uh, we start, you know, we figure out the season themes. We try and do those kind of in groups so we're not like doing one season theme at a time all the time we try and plan out kind of three to six at a time uh and that gives us some flexibility too to move things around if we come up with a different idea or if we realize one might be a little bit better positioned at a different time uh so yeah we kind of bucket them out and we did that for this year already that's roughly how we do it so we're soon uh not like immediately but like in the next couple months we'll start planning out what are the seasons for the first half of 2026 going to start really looking like uh, so we we get our theme. We then once we have our theme, we already we usually pick our theme based on the knowledge that there are exciting characters and cards to make there, uh, and then we start looking for them. And sometimes we get go through you know like what options are available to us, and maybe we're like actually this is not a super great theme. Uh, we probably don't want to do it. Uh, then maybe we'll go back to the drawing board and or pull one of the ones that's later in the year forward, and and then you know just wash, rinse, repeat. Uh, so once we've identified roughly the character list we want, I usually go for like one or two more than we might need for the season so that we can kind of run it through some people and see like who's more appealing to them and why. Um, so usually we'll have like roughly, let's say, eight characters uh, that we'll pick and maybe three locations, four locations as ideas. Then we start brainstorming designs. And that's a pretty straightforward process. We just go card by card. And as a group, we'll just all pitch basically like, what do we think is cool about this? What do we think is cool about and, and just go and go. Uh, we usually gather, let's say, like 20 designs about that way per card starts. Uh, then I filter them down usually to about like six to eight. And we rank those uh, based on what we think is like the most promising place to start. And that's when we put it into a playtest build of the game and start playing. And that's and then from there, it's kind of straightforward. You just play test. If it's bad, you change it. Uh, if you think that you're on the right track, you iterate on that and so on and so forth. Do you have a dedicated Has- playtesting team at this point? No, uh, we have the internal play tests are uh, a lot of excellent people volunteering their time during the week. Uh, so we have two different ones. We have an internal play test of focused play testers who are people volunteering uh, their time to come and build their own decks and experiment with the cards in kind of a little bit more competitive, a little bit more uh, player based. Like this is the experience of being a player with these cards, basically. Uh, and then we have a weekly play test with uh, a larger group within the company where you know we'll prescribe them decks or cards to play and, and ask them sp- some specific questions about what goes on in their games and how they feel about the content and they'll do that and then yeah we'll just do, we do that every single week uh for two different play tests have you guys changed any of those processes in the wake of the end of last year uh, yes we... you guys okay yeah, we've made a number of updates. Uh, I actually rebuilt the entire, like, we have, like, a weekly kind of procedure that design goes through uh, each week. And uh, in order to integrate some of those changes, including positioning those play tests to have, like, more easy attendance for people on the team, uh, we rebuilt the entire schedule uh, a little bit. So that's one of the ways in which it changed. We are planning to eventually kind of communicate a little bit more to players about the variety of changes that we made to improve the overall balance of the game and make sure that we're re- releasing uh, higher quality content because uh, we made more than more than just that one. Uh, but I can't really release all of those right now. And I do want to talk about them kind of all in a group rather than piecemeal them out so that people can kind of get a more full understanding of how yeah. things go. I do remember last time you were on the podcast, you were talking about um, sort of like what makes you proud and the legacy that you leave behind uh, through your work. And you talked about sort of those back end processes that you've implemented at Second Dinner and how um, just how proud of them you are and how important they are to you. So it's it's cool to hear that. I want to ask you because last time we talked to you, I think was it was either right when Loki released or right before Loki released. I just want to ask you about that card week as a one re- Loki. Week one Loki. Week one. I want to ask you about that card as a retrospective. Were there any lessons that y'all learned on the team? Um, and can you just talk a little bit more about him? Because we never really got the full story from glenn jones on loki because he was such a new sure. the time. yeah i mean i've talked a little bit publicly about some of the things that i think went good and went bad um i mean one of the ones that we had talked about was we kind of just missed the combination of loki and elsa 
uh, in part because all of our Elsa decks were really dependent on Kitty, and and our best ones were Beast and Falcon decks, and it didn't really seem like putting all of your cards back in your hand is what you wanted to be doing with Loki. Uh, so we kind of wrote it off. I think we, if we had a larger testing team or you know, just more direct attention on it, uh, I'm sure we would have gotten around to trying it out. But as we discussed before, it's really hard to make cards at the pace that we make them. So uh, we took a, 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 I would guess it's fair to call it like kind of a shortcut on development in that particular category, just not building out that deck and testing it exhaustively. Uh, so yeah, we mostly just missed how strong that deck was. And of course it turned out to be like by far and away the best of the Loki decks. Uh, so that was kind of unlucky. Uh, <laughs> we could have, we could have missed it and it could have just been yeah. good, but instead it was actually, it was the best. Um, so yeah, that was like probably the biggest thing that went on. I mean, it was a very difficult card to evaluate internally. It's a very, you know, we use these, uh, internal play tests, which we've improved since as well, but we really rely on them to kind of be proxies for, the player experience. So, you know, if a, if a lot of our play testers are playing with the new Loki card and their reaction is like, ah, this doesn't seem that exciting. Or like, I don't want to throw my hand away. Like they're, they're, they're having, you know, reticence around that. Like, okay, we need to look at the design and figure out, should we change it? Or is there a way that we can make them happier to be engaging in this gameplay? Um, so we, you know, iterated on Loki until we got to a point where, yeah, he was doing something that was cool and people were excited to dive into the, to make it happen. And then from there, yeah, like we had our Loki decks. Certainly we released him, I think, at like the strongest stat line that was even plausible uh, with the kind of impact he's going to have on the game. As it turns out, it was obviously way too strong. Uh, but yeah, we we definitely took probably like the most amount of risk there. And unfortunately, it also collided with a spot where we had taken uh, an unnecessary or maybe just like an, un an observed risk uh, with the actual like what is the best Loki deck. Uh, and for what it's worth with our balance, like we basically never try to find out what the best version of a deck is. It would be a very large waste of time given the frequency with which we change both the cards in development and the cards live. Um, like, I mean, imagine if Elsa just, you know, had become like a four cost card or whatever before, like, because we released Loki first, like, all right, well, why would, why would it even matter that we found this Loki deck? You know, so we have to kind of triage out like how important is it to figure out what's good and, what's like the actual best thing is a little low on importance, but we want to know kind of the range of what the best things are. Uh, War Machine is a good example of that, where it's like, okay, we need to know like how good is playing War Machine with Infinite. We don't need the best War Machine Infinite deck, but we do need to know like, is this really good? And to get an idea of it and then cost the card appropriately around that. Awesome. Can I ask the same question, but just with Blob? Yeah, I think Blob was a, a large confluence of things. Uh, certainly, I think it was a card that I think it's probably our largest like miss on like how good it is versus how good we thought it was because we thought it was good. Uh, we actually think I think thought it was better than a lot of people based on some of the the content creator previews. Like we were like there there were definitely some internal talks. Where we were like, is he not good enough? Like are we way off base? Like and you got to remember we were also like hot on the heels of like Loki and Elsa where we had kind of missed really high on those cards and now we've got it kind of feels like the sentiment is saying we're going to be missing low here and we're like are we missing low? Like, I don't, maybe we were scared after Loki and Elsa and we nerfed Blob too much. I don't, but that doesn't feel right to us based on, but yeah, we, we actually had the real, uh, like questioning ourselves moment with Blob. Um, I don't think we buffed. We did. Uh, no, we did actually, we did buff him very slightly, uh, based on those questions. Uh, we you put him in Vetcher moment. That's we awesome. put him over, <laughs> we put him over three power, because of his relationship with Shadow King, that was or at three power, I should say. Like that was the the inspiration for doing that. It was like, oh, let's make sure that like the best counter to him is not as good as maybe it's it would be otherwise. Uh, but yeah, as it turns out, like zero would have been totally fine and still way too strong. So there, that's how it goes. Yeah, I mean, like I was one of those people who was like, I don't really get it. It's just one big guy in one lane. I don't, I don't, I don't really see it. And then you play it, and it's like a six fifty, and you're like. Oh, I get it now. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I totally understand. It's perhaps easier to win when you only focus on two lanes for yeah. four or five of the turns. Yeah. It's <laughs> crazy. It's it's just oh, that's a 650. I get it. That's very large. I have discovered that. So I guess jumping off of that, what's the limit on a card that you're like plausibly willing to let it go to? Like you obviously can't do 50, you probably can't do 40, you probably can't do 30. Like, what's the blob index, right? Like yeah, yeah. I mean, it's about how hard it is to get there, right? Like, I don't know which card you say gets there, um, but there's, you know, the Onslaught, Iron Man, et cetera, like, yeah. being, like, it's super cool that we can make a number that big in our game. That's rad. Like, lots of games don't do that. Uh, we do. So, that's awesome. Uh, 
the but yeah it's really all about difficulty i mean if you had to play like if we had a card that was like if you played all 12 cards in your starting deck like this card has 100 powers or something like that it's like yeah cool like that's that's probably fine <laughs> I don't know, like, yeah, Ross, is that, that, you should bring yeah. that is that that scary <laughs> no that's <laughs> um, awesome yeah so that that's really it's not about like what is a valid integer it's about what is the what is a valid like cost to the integer relationship that we can generate and and cost in this case being a lot more than just energy like how much right. you know work and effort you have to put into it um so yeah I, I think part of the fun of snap is actually figuring out what are the ways that we can make more like onslaught iron man type situations like how can we create really appealing combos uh i know that's not necessarily your jam maybe uh, but like phoenix sports i think is in that space uh, mm. like how can we let people do something that just feels like outlandishly strong relative to what's going on but is not broken necessarily and i think phoenix force has eventually gotten into a really good spot on that count where it's very exciting but it also is you know not that problematic i mean i i i will admit it's not problematic while still hating it but yes uh <laughs> I, uh here's a question for you if thanos didn't exist do you think old blob would have been in the range of okay a more cool mm. card like blob tribunal cool yeah. that's nice like if, if it wasn't a thanos card is this an actual card you can print i mean uh it may be at zero, maybe at zero power he could have stayed uh but blob thanos wasn't actually the best blob deck when we did nerf him the best blob deck was uh just playing a bunch of big cards uh and i think it played living tribunal as well actually that was like the one that just had the strongest win rate. It was basically like, what if Shuri was a blob deck was kind of the, yeah. r the rough concept. Like that's, that sounds weird to say, but that's essentially what it is. Right. Uh, just play like two or three, like super powerful things in conjunction with one another. Um, so that was the best of the decks. And I think that deck would have been essentially equally good. So may it's a maybe, I think like it would have really depended on how that deck wound up sorting things out. Because if that deck had wound up settling into a spot similar to where a deck like Shuri is now, yeah, Bro Blob could probably sit around, but at the same time, it would inevitably, you know, bump into something else that is going to do this, like shuffle a bunch of stuff in your deck, because that's just design space that we're definitely going to mine. It's yeah, we Shap Snap as a game is like fairly shallow on design space relative to what a lot of other uh, CCGs offer. You know, we only have two numbers on our cards, like that's a, a clear indicator of the fact that we need to really reach out uh, and find things. So whenever there's something as easy and fertile as like shuffling cards in your deck, like we just know we're going to need that. So locking ourselves out of it is kind of awkward probably probably would just inevitably need to change him and maybe would change him early anyway just to bounce the deck a better a little bit better speaking of phoenix force we have a question here from plinks that says do you ever plan on creating something official to document the rules of marvel snap so rules interactions <laughs> like, stuff like that <laughs> yeah there's there's we've internally debated kind of about the value of such a document like we don't have you know a dedicated like organized play thing going on which is what a lot of mm -hmm. where that document comes in handy for like the vast majority of people uh like when magic has a comprehensive rules but it's not for anyone who plays magic it's for the people who run magic events right like that's essentially true um so we don't have like an active plan to make one uh it's the sort of thing where if i had the resources to make it i would make it just because i think it's a good thing to make like i would enjoy making it and i think it would be cool to have uh but it is also i you know, having i've literally helped make the comprehensive rules for magic i've edited them which is a trip mm. uh it's a lot of work it's not a simple thing to uh develop a, a truly comprehensive set of rules and interactions uh and i just don't do not have the ability to resource for that right now um one day if i did i think it would be cool and i also think it would ultimately wind up leading to you know some good improvements to the game because i'm sure as part of vetting those rules we would wind up finding a couple of things where we're like oh we actually don't like this very much uh and get them solved so it has upside for us as well but it is just a, a relatively low return for a really high investment like it would probably be about as difficult to make a season as it would be to develop a comprehensive rules uh for snap and we wouldn't sell it so it's a really <laughs> tough thing to argue with my my supervisors i should spend time doing i think hey uh, do you want me to lose you a month's worth of money it would yeah. be cool i think for players uh that have not played other card games and have not read the comprehensive rules for something like magic or any of the other tcgs offered do not appreciate how freaking complicated those things are because it is uh, it's it, let me tell you something it's a lot of work to read let, let, alone, yeah. let alone create <laughs> It is much harder to create than to read. Yeah. <laughs> I I have been rank one on MTG Arena. 
I have never opened the magic comprehensive rules. <laughs> like that's, I think the average experience of a magic player is having never yeah. looked at them at all. And that's really what you want as a game developer as well. Like if you're playing a game where people need to know every minute rule in order to, you know, feel success in your game, like that's an indicator. You should probably button some stuff up because uh, you really want your game to play much more intuitively than that. Well, along those notes, have you spent a lot of time playing Phoenix Force? Because there's a lot of weird <laughs> shit in that deck. <laughs> it's one of my favorite decks. And uh, yeah, there's a lot of weird interactions. I think that's actually like a lot of the charm and magic of the deck is that it offers people who want to deeply invest in something a really deep well to learn a lot about what they can do. Uh, and I think that you want, you definitely want stuff like that in your game. Like that's how the, you know, she referred to the psychographics popularized by magic. Like that's Johnny's jam, yeah. right? Like you really want there to be something, uh, Johnny's about showing that their sophistication is with the game is very high. Like it doesn't matter win or lose, whatever, but like being able to just execute on something where it's like, you bet you didn't even know I could do that. Like that's Johnny's vibe and Phoenix force offers that. I feel attacked. Um, but yeah, that's absolutely true. <laughs> yeah. Phoenix force is one of my favorite decks in Marvel snap. Cause I feel like it just shows the, like for me, it showed is the beauty of the engine and all these like funky things you can do. Also the funniest thing about Phoenix force for me is that I still think after playing it as much as I have, I know what Phoenix force does based off of heuristics, not off of knowing any core engine or any sort of interactions with Marvel snap. Like for me, it's just like, I've memorized the document on where things go when they move. And it's just, <laughs> it's, it is literally heuristic based. You have uh, the comprehensive rules of yeah. Phoenix force <laughs> right in front of you, but they're, they're done through examples, not done through any explanation. Yeah. It's just like, if this, then that, okay. Sounds yeah. good. Um, yeah, an awesome deck. All right, next one's from Panda Boy. They say, for Glenn, I'm a big fan of brewing, but I found that uh, that the more niche decks I used to be able to play to infinite successfully six months ago, such as Spectrum Wong or Cerebro, uh, don't play well into top-tier decks nowadays. Is this just a skill issue on my part or even an MMR-based experience, or is this something other players experience across the meta? If so, are there plans to reduce the peaks of power in the game to allow non-tier, I'm assuming one decks, uh, some breathing room? Big fan of all you do. Sure. Uh, I do think it's a fairly natural tendency that as players grow and uh, add skill in the game, like the game is going to place them in environments that are more competitive and necessarily just favor optimizing more and more. Uh, like when you're a stronger than the players around you, you can play much worse decks and enjoy a fairly similar performance than you can once you're playing amongst your peers. Uh, so that's just a natural thing that happens and makes it a little bit more difficult to brew if you're interested in doing things like you know climbing to the top of the ladder and, and stuff like that. Uh, I don't think that everyone needs that goal, of course, uh, and we do want it to be really fun to brew and snap. And I think the retreat mechanic is something we really rely on to kind of, or more specifically the snap mechanic, I suppose, to really uh, help those decks succeed because you can have a dramatically weaker win rate uh, if you're playing with a much more surprising deck because of all the cube equity that you can gain. We've, we've seen that play out with a lot of various decks that can maintain a negative win rate and a very positive cube rate like Galactus. Uh, you know, did that for, at one point in, in his life cycle. And Mr. Negative and Hello are two, are two decks that similarly usually maintain a negative win rate, but all, often can maintain a positive cube rate for some amount, some stretches of time at least. Uh, so that's kind of what we really rely on to make sure that brewing is good. Is like if you're going to brew a deck, you also have to learn to be good at snapping with it, uh, which is kind of a constraint. Like, you know, other games don't really have that. Like, in order to, you know, be a, a brewer in Magic, you don't also need to learn you know, a, a, another extra mechanic to, or, or all of your brewing is for naught. Um, so that's a, that is certainly, I think, a barrier that is kind of interesting about how brewing can be both saved and kind of more difficult in our game to really feel rewarded by. Uh, but to answer, like, the specific question, like, I do think we the meta decks, like, are a little too sticky at the top. Uh, and I have a handful of ideas about how to make some adjustments that will make brewing a little bit more rewarded. Uh, certainly like that's the idea behind some of the stuff we've done with the recent imbalance events was measuring like does something like this uh, impact what people are doing enough that we can like consider it you know, that's one way we can reinforce like you know break out the collection find a new deck uh, the, the meta decks just aren't going to be as good this week mm. and I think like well, I think that there's something in that space uh, that's pretty exciting and I think there's other other solutions as well um, both from like just a, a balance structuring standpoint and an event standpoint uh, certainly. Yeah, could... the X-Men one specifically, I wanted to shout out because I don't think it was like the best deck, but like mm -hmm. one of the five best decks was just X-Men pile. Yeah. Like and like that is just like, oh, damn, that actually really worked. Whereas you compare to the first event where it was like, yeah, a little iffy. 
there was actually just like X-Men Pile Surfer. And I was like, that is that is one of the five best decks in the game right now because of yeah. this event happening. Yeah, I just wanted you, if you could elaborate just on the lessons learned and takeaways from these imbalance events now that you have time to look back at them and how they, yeah, how do they impact design for the future? You spoke about it slightly there, but I just wanted mm -hmm. you, to, you could uh, elaborate a bit. Yeah, I can't, can't go too deep into all of our learnings around them, but they have been really interesting. Uh, the I can't say they they were very different on purpose. Like the first one, we really were measuring like both can we do this, uh, like both like how feasible is it for us to implement, uh, and also will people receive it positively. So we didn't want to release something that was a really dramatic shift in power, uh, because we might not learn whether it was cool to do because people might have been very upset about how intensely it impacted their experience, and we would have had too much noise in the data. So having a a, a mode that was like a, or an event I should say that was a little lighter and how it touched things uh, gave us the ability to say like, all right, do people just think power couples is a cool idea? Like we can find a lot of data on that because that's what people are talking about more so than whether it's particularly busted. Uh, and as we know, it wasn't particularly busted, which is very purposeful. Then the second time we definitely wanted to kind of take the other route, which is like, okay, we know that people thought it was pretty cool. Like we'll see, do they think it is cool the second time? That's meaningful data. Uh, and do they think it is cool if we, you know, pick it up just a little bit, like move it closer to like, we expect this to actually impact the, the meta game. Um, so yeah, those are like kind of why we ran the experiment in different ways in both cases. And we learned a lot about what players liked and didn't like. Uh, certainly I wouldn't say that they were, you know, either one was universally beloved, uh, but the sentiment overall like seems to have trended really high. Like yeah, we're, we're excited about how it went, think it went well. Um, yeah. mm -hmm. Is there any uh consideration for the vastly different sizes of the events as a like key to why because my in my head i'm like i think i understand why the avx one went better and it's because players could do more with it they weren't put in a box the same way but i don't know yeah. if it's that or if it's just you know it was just stronger ability to get or anything like that yeah that, that really ties back into the impact thing like we were, we were just really constraining the impact like a, a, a given power couple was like you were only six, like 60 percent to ever even get the bonus right so it's like 60 yeah. percent of the time with these two cards in your deck you get two, one or two power like that is just not very strong um so they were structured specifically to avoid them being really dramatically influential on what you would normally do. Kind of like hot and featured locations in a way. Like ABX was basically like a hot and featured location level of impact, but power couples didn't quite even get that high. Uh, it was just a kind of cool thing that was going on. This brings me to my favorite drum to beat. Can can we replace a hot and featured location <laughs> with one of these, please? <laughs> Glad uh, we're, we're not going to we're not going to replace it with one of these. Uh, okay. Setting a hot and featured location is dramatically easier than building an okay. imbalance event. <laughs> yeah. I would do it for free. I would literally I, I do would, it for free, Glenn. I would build you imbalance events for free if it got rid of hot I, and featured locations. I do. I don't believe you. If you knew how hard <laughs> you were to implement, I just do not believe you. Uh, uh, but. I, I will say, like, it, there is a world of, like, if you told me in a theoretical, like, future that, like, we were doing an imbalance event every week or something. I'm not saying that we are. I'm just saying in that theoretical future, I do think it would probably be inappropriate to have two hot and featured location days because you would be really filling a lot of the space that 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 happens to overlap in such a way. So I, I don't expect they, they do overlap in a meaningful way. And, and I could see some world where we do less hot and featured locations, assuming something like an imbalance event was. I was just thinking, uh, like, you know, or, like the faction thing, probably. the faction thing played, right? You could just do like today's X Men Day. Boom, they get the X Men. Today's Avengers Day. Today's Defenders Day. You could do that. You could run with it. It would be a hot and featured location, mm -hmm. but I wouldn't have to see it in all of my games. <laughs> it's not all of your games. Um, it's fifty percent of my games, which is all of my games. Okay. <laughs> what did What did you learn about the Marvel Snap player base's uh, sort of palatability for these kind of changes? Like, how far can you guys push it in the future? Did you like? I'm just wondering if you've gotten any insight on sort of the psychology of players and how much the game can be disrupted, where they enjoy it or they're pissed off. Uh, no, I, I don't think we really tested the limits with any of this stuff uh, in particular. A, a lot of our learnings were around like what makes it a smoother thing. Like, for example, the Avengers bonus not having VFX. That was clearly confused a lot of people. We saw a number of Reddit posts or tweets or whatever where people were like, where did this three power come from? I was like, okay, like, you know, that that's, uh, we obviously know in general that like that's something we would want to be effects. And part of doing these imbalance events as kind of like quick, quick hype little run, run outs is that we don't have the ability to necessarily put really cool VFX behind them uh, on the time frame that we were developing them. But 
that's the, yeah, that's the sort of thing that we did learn from it is like, how could we make it better? Uh, we didn't really learn much about testing the limits because we didn't do that. So the feed, none of the feedback was really meaningfully addressing that. Mm -hmm. Okay, our next question is from XD Ray. They say, I have a question for Glenn regarding how they approach balance balance changes. When you're looking to make a change to a card due to either being too strong or too weak, how do you decide whether you want to take a big swing at the card or a few small tweaks with uh, with potential for more? Some recent examples I'm thinking of are the change to Darkhawk from four, five, uh, from four to five costs versus the change to APOC that simply shaved a few, few points of power off of it. Yeah, yeah. Uh... It's really all about context. You just changes are very different. No, no balance change is like a lot, like exactly like another balance change. Really, uh, they may have similarities that you know we rely on. Uh, but yeah, I, I, even just using those two examples, uh, what did we want to change about Darkhawk? Like, we didn't just want to make Darkhawk weaker, although that was a goal. We also had seen like Darkhawk was kind of just making things really stale alongside Zabu, uh, and we wanted to know like, okay, like what if we just removed what was the default best thing to pair with Zabu and changed it to make there were a, a wider variety of things that maybe are competitive with one another to pair with Zabu. Uh, so we need to actually change the pattern that Darkhawk plays in in order to do that. So that's why you know we wound up moving him to five cost. Uh, whereas with Apocalypse, we like his pattern. We don't want to change that at all. We just want to take a little bit of strength off the top. Uh, and I think in both cases, like we essentially accomplished the goals. Like Darkhawk actually was better the week after we nerfed him than he was the week before on win rate. Uh, he's He's average kind of out roughly similar ish now, but yeah, like that, that's ideal. Like we, cause our focus really was changing the pattern, not necessarily making the card bad. Uh, and apocalypse in turn. Yeah. Like does still does the job very well is still the, one of the best cards in the discard deck. Uh, he was not number one last week, but he was, he was number two and that's exactly where we want him to be. So. Yeah. I, I, when I read this question, I was so like, oh man, you could have had a better example with that because dark Hawk definitely actually got better. Like the, the yo Woody deck with, uh, <laughs> with, uh, like the bounce thing. It was like, like the only people playing the card were people who were like playing that deck and watching that channel basically. And so it was like a bunch of highly invested players. I'm not surprised it ended up getting better for a week basically because yeah. everyone else dropped the card. And so like you have a bunch of like highly invested, highly motivated players all playing that deck until it popularizes itself. And then people are like, okay, it actually is weaker. Fine. It's a little bit worse. All right. Yeah. Next one is from Chaos Hop Chaos Hat. They say, how do you feel about patches slash OTAs that aren't necessarily targeted at balance, but more at changes for changes sake? For me personally, I know a huge part of my enjoyment in Snap is seeing uh, what new toys I can dust off for a little while. Yeah, I, mean, I like doing those. Uh, all of our OTAs, I think, include you know, at least one or two cards that we're just kind of changing to see what happens. Uh, usually we target weak cards for that, obviously, uh, so that we can just buff them and see if they can make a difference. Uh, certainly sometimes it goes well, sometimes it doesn't go well. Uh, I mean, Adam Warlock is essentially an example of this, right? Like, we were just, ah, let's just see. Like, it's not gonna, we, if it does nothing, that's fine. It really wasn't doing anything before. It's a costless change for us to make. Uh, I, I understand there was a fair amount of like community, a negative community sentiment around it, but it's like, we could have just not changed the card at all. And is that a better world than the world where we tried something new? I'm inclined to generally think no. Uh, maybe, maybe that's true sometimes. Like we're not going to be 100% uh, on anything, but by by as a default, I like to do a little bit of change over remaining in stasis when it comes to small stuff like that that can make the game maybe a little bit more charming or a little bit more interesting. Even even if it turns out to not work, like just having people like try a few things with Adam Warlock for a day is better than what he was going on with him before from like an, an engagement and excitement standpoint. So the yeah. Adam Warlock thing is really fascinating to me because it goes like this with all these like mid to terrible cards that get like a change in some way. Do you like as to me, I look at it the same way you do, which is like, OK, we have a ton of latitude because this card absolutely sucks. But one of the thing about these cards that absolutely sucks is people sort of like imprint on. They're like, I'm the Adam Warlock guy. Yeah. And then like you take that away and it's like, I like I, I don't know what to say to those people when like something like that comes up, because it's like my instinct is the same as yours. Like this card was trash. You have to try it somewhere else. Or you're just going to rework it eventually. So you might as well just throw something at the wall and see what happens on it. How do you like, do you just say to those people like, look, this is what's best for the game and we've got to try doing this? Is that what we, what you'd say if someone like that was like, Glenn, I was the Adam guy and now I'm not the Adam guy. Yeah, I mean, it's a tricky spot. Part of it is we look at play rate, you know, like if the play rate for the card is very small, we know that there's just not a lot of quote unquote Adam guys out there. Uh, yeah. 
So that's something that we factor into, like, how much do we have to be worried about that person? Uh, it's not to say we want to discard them. Like, we value them. I totally understand that there are definitely people out there for whom, like, turn one Bass, turn two Adam Warlock was, like, the best feeling that they have in Snap, and they're sad that they don't get to have it anymore. Uh, I, I get that. But, like, imagine the future where actually what we had done just happened to be great. Like, maybe Adam became, like, I don't know, like, the 10th or 11th best card in the game or whatever. Obviously, I didn't expect that to happen. In fact, we purposefully structured that to not happen. Uh, but another change could have done that, right? Like some other change that we made could have wound up being that level of uh, change. And you want us to just take all of those swings, basically. I think every time that we step up to bat, you want us to give it a go because most of the time it's more likely to work out really positively. Uh, and some of the time the, the specifics are just like, nope, that's that's not going to do it. And that person's going to have uh, nothing really to, to go back to or to get excited about. Um, I'm trying to think of like, what's a good and e good and easy like counter example where we buffed a card off of the bottom mm -hmm. for yeah sure forge is exactly right yeah like the the philosophy you're describing about like why one would not nerf adam warlock would have led us to not buff forge to what one cost uh because you know that that's would have disrupted patterns for the, a lot of his decks um and you want us to take those kinds of swings like i think it's exciting that we do I think Forge is a fascinating one because he ended up going to where he was, but plus one power. And he just like took this whole journey mm -hmm. around everywhere. What do you think? Like, you know, it's the hero's journey. You, you, you go out somewhere, you do your, you do you on your quest, you return home, having changed. What did you learn from Forge's hero's journey? I learned that I am super good at balancing snap cards. Uh, well, the, <laughs> the, <laughs> the original Forge balance, like the very first one from two, one to plus two was going to be two, two to plus two. Uh, and we wound up like, you know, we talked to, internally, it was on the board, like we played with it and we were like, hey, let's try two, one to plus three. And I was like, I'm pretty sure to do it. Uh, no, but so that was like, yeah. <laughs> so we wound up going like all around whale. the circle. Like you were like, oh, no, I know where like... this goes. I know where See, this goes. The thing, the thing is though, like, it's a good example of why I think Snap's balance philosophy is actually really different from other games in a positive way is like in any other game, like that would wind up feeling kind of like a mistake. But for us, we don't think it was a mistake. We think people played with like three two, or well, two awesome different forges for a bunch of time and had a bunch of excitement that they wouldn't have had if we went from two, one plus two to two, two plus two, like all of that joy is just lost because we did like the best, the, cor the correct forge, uh, like correct, correct balance is like, I think highly over it. Players really, I think, grab onto this idea that like every card has like a perfectly balanced point. Um, but the cards aren't the game, right? Like the game, the game is the cards being splashed into play. And if they change from time to time, that's what makes, I think the game really dynamic and fun. I think balance, balance exists in imbalance uh, in a lot of ways for the, the perfect games. League of legends is a really good example of a game that historically has really thrived off of uh, the imbalances within its system, uh, moving and being corrected and changing and being created. Like, a lot of cool things happen and develop from the imbalances they allow to exist in their system rather than trying to get every champion exactly perfect and then never change it again, which would just like make the game way less fun. Forge is a great example of decks being created out of him that otherwise yeah. would not have existed, right? There's like all of these bounce decks, which after Forge left are notably worse. The yeah. Brood Abs deck, which again caused Forge to be moved differently into uh, a one, the, like what made him a bounce card effectively, because he was previously a Brood Abs card, right? Like that stuff is, it was a nice journey for Forge. And I think right. that's like the biggest argument for that. I, my one question is like, Forge is sort of not like the only success story of that. But it's like, can we get some more journeys going? You know what I mean? Can we, can we just like try some well, more forges? I mean, we don't actively avoid them, uh, but you know, you, it's the sort of thing you don't really know you're on a journey until you wind up uh, on it. Like, right. we didn't expect the Absorbing Man Brood deck to become like the best deck overnight when we made that change. We expected it would become a deck, probably. Um, so yeah, like we we want those kinds of things to happen, but we don't want that to be all that happens either. Like we do want to like when we say like, hey, we want to do you know like create plus two win percent or minus two win percent. Like we also mostly want that to happen. Uh, so if some of the time we have some unexpected cool side effects, that's great. Uh, and that is also part of our philosophy when we especially have to nerf cards uh, is that we try and see if we can re recontextualize them a little bit so that they're not just worse. Because everyone knows, like, I mean, Apocalypse is a good example of that where we wouldn't do it, right? Because if we change the context of Apocalypse, we're doing a lot more than nerfing and we're redesigning a deck. Uh, so we wouldn't want to do it there. Uh, but Darkhawk's probably a closer example of, like, yeah, like, let's change what the card is doing in the decks that you would play him in. 
uh, and see what happens in that context. And that winds up sending us on journeys, incidentally, because the decks are new, there's emergent gameplay coming up, uh, and hopefully they're fun, and we get to see what happens there, and maybe the card changes, maybe it doesn't, but uh, that's why we really try to, as often as possible, find something that's uh, like, what if the card was the same but different? And Elias another like kind of example of that. Uh, obviously, he's a hotter topic in a lot of ways, but uh, adjusting him to care about Unrevealed versus the turn specifically kind of made him a little bit more novel, changed a little bit of the things that he does. Uh, yeah. I think you said something really important in regards to imbalance and balance. And um, like, I think it's sort of a huge fallacy with a lot of players that encounter card games and they, uh, they assume that the, the perfect game or that the end of the tunnel is just a perfectly balanced game. And I, abs I think that's absolutely incorrect. I think that the, the perfect card game or at least trending towards the perfect version of a card game is an imbalanced game. Maybe not a wildly imbalanced game, but imbalances are what makes game, what make game, what makes games fun? Um, I think one of my biggest disappointments with this new age of TCGs is how safe they play it and how balanced they try to make their games. And I think it leads to sort of uninspiring and some and sometimes not very fun gameplay. And I'm, I think that yeah, the few sort of like this what what may have been the uh, originated as like fire design in Magic. I think that is. Just I, it's much yeah. more congruent with my vision for what is a good and fun card game because card games at the end of the day are meant to be fun. They aren't supposed to have the highest level of competitive integrity. I think a lot of people will take, um, you know, take the competitive the competitive integrity of chess and then force it onto their card game, and it just leads to this like massive incongruence, and it, it, it just doesn't work at all. Because what make what what makes these games fun is the imbalance, the variance, and just like the the new and exciting scenarios that you have to adapt to. Yeah, ma like Magic's not built for the Pro Tour level of play. That's just a byproduct of Magic being rad. Uh, and sim similar, like Runeterra, I think is actually a really good case study in this, where uh, I, I like Runeterra. I think it was a, a really well-designed and fun game. Uh, and I really like the Path of Champions mode, too. But very early on, their balance, uh, they basically like were fairly consistently kind of like ticking things down uh, over time. Uh, and that was more balanced, but they were really removing a lot of the poles that were available in, in to specific groups in their game. And they wound up eventually doing a patch that, you know, undid a ton of their balance changes that they had done previously and leaning, kind of leaning into like, okay, no, we actually need stuff. Like, I think it was like Molten Rain was like one of the key ones where it was like, uh, an AOE card that was really impactful and they wound up just restoring it to its original state because it's not like, no, th this faction's about AOE. We need them to have a good card that does it when we, by nerfing it into a shape where it was no longer strong, the faction just lost way too much identity. It's important for cards like that to be strong uh, in order to accomplish the goals of the game, which is having like really exciting opportunities to their factions. One of the things that struck me and continues to strike me about Runeterra, and I guess I, I, I'd be interested to hear Brendan name some names as to the card games he thinks are are, are doing this because like i'll name one and I, I like the one i think of is runeterra mm -hmm. where it's like this is a game that is clearly designed to be hyper or as competitive as a card game can be to fix some of the problems in like a mana system type thing right like we're we're setting out to fix the imbalances of that and it always struck me as uh, not like, I don't want to use the word lifeless, but like a touch less exciting than several of its competitors because of. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, if you want me to name names for me, it's uh, for me, it's Flesh and Blood, but that's not because Flesh and Blood is a bad game. It's, I think it's a fantastic mm -hmm. competitive game. It's mm -hmm. probably the best game that you can compete in if you want to play TCGs at a high level. Uh, that being said, as the more powerful decks, and I guess what the word you could use is asymmetric decks, have rotated out of the format because the way decks rotate in Flesh and Blood is they accru they accrue points from winning major tournaments. So the the really good decks rotate out, and those tend to be the decks that don't really engage with the the fundamental game system in like a very linear way. As they've rotated out, the game might be more balanced uh, on paper, but ultimately like. The, the play style because of how the resource system interacts right. with the mathematical values on the cards, the play styles feel very, very similar. And what happens is when the game gets super balanced, the variance levers become really clear and they're not fun variance levers. They're die roll variance levers, they're uh, randomization variance levers, whether it's like, you know, at roll this dice, you get X more action points. It's like they become much more clear and much more polarizing for players. And I don't think that card game players necessarily sign up for, you know, they want variance in their game. Like card gamers, whether they admit it or not, 
like variants. But when it when it becomes abundantly clear, like also what happens in a game like Lorcana, that the die roll is a massive, like a massive level of variance, that's not the variance they signed up for. That's an unfun level of variance. When the differential well, can get to something like 20, 24%, like it is in Magic, or sorry, not in Magic, like uh, Lorcana, because they they have the, the data for the online third party, it's a level of variance that players, they don't necessarily have the power for. I think it should exist, but at what yeah. extreme? I've got a I've got a very anti player take here. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um I think the variance players sign up for is I can beat a better player than me. <laughs> Not that it is possible for a player that is worse to beat a player that is better. I can beat a player better than me. <laughs> like that's that's my anti player take where it's like when people like there is a degree to which like, OK, you know, we stripped all the artifice out of this. This doesn't feel like a contest of skill anymore. But if you're telling me that, like, you know, roll a dice, like there's no odds you can take on that where it's like, all right, I'm 66 percent to win. I'm going to play to win. That's that's card gaming. That's what you're doing anyway. Right. Like if you have a roll, if you have to roll, I don't, I don't really know what you're talking about. Like you have to roll a D20 and 12 of them are good outcomes and eight of them are bad. And you're like staking it all on that. Right. Like. I, I think the card you're talking about is like a scab green something. Leathers, I don't know. <laughs> like, yes. It's a card where you the, roll a d6. Um, it is. But the like, example I come to with that one is uh, like er- very early Hearthstone. Like the card pool was super shallow, mm. and the best like the the best deck you know was a very, very aggressive at the time, and the card stats traded off a ton. There's a lot of attrition, and so like Knife Juggler like defined that game mm-hmm. for yes. a really long period, and it's because there just was no other variance in the game that was as strong as Knife Juggler. So Knife Juggler was the way that players could overcome uh, a skill gap. Like he was just by far and away like. I wasn't like a you know, professional Hearthstone player at the time, so maybe I'm like slightly inaccurate. But like at the base level, like yeah, like there were tons of decks were just like knife juggler mirrors, and the, you know, that was where all of the variants rested. And I don't think that's a fun spot to put it all. Like you really want to mix it up a lot more than knife juggler. I guess like Animal Companion was technically a spot it lived as well during that period because that card was good enough to see play. This um, is actually the problem with the NBA right now because all the <laughs> variance is in jacking three point shots and there's nowhere else to play. I don't agree with that. I don't agree with that. <laughs> uh, so Glenn, there's like a, there's like an infamous meme on this podcast now. Anytime we mention anything that's not Marvel Snap, our entire right. comment section gets absolutely spammed with this is my favorite X oh, yeah. podcast. Yeah, this this is my favorite NBA podcast. Take that, Zach Lowe. Yeah. Um take it. <laughs> just to just to antagonize the listeners a little bit more, I would I don't I don't know if I'm necessarily I, like I, I, I'm asking for your take, but Fab has this really. It's in this really interesting design problem where it is the best. You know, it's opinion based, but I think that in terms of like you, you <laughs> want to compete on a on the pro tour, you want to be able to make money, um, and you want to be able to do that with a reasonable level of confidence. I think it's the best competitive card game. But Flesh and Blood is now trying to draw, design itself backwards a bit because it realizes that the same system that uh, sort of made that possible is not the same system that makes the game fun casually. Because it created huge win rate yeah. differential with experienced players and novice players. And now they have to do the work of designing themselves out of that rut. But at the same time, when they do that, they disenfranchise their most loyal player base, which is what's propping it up right now, which is the Pro Tour players. Oh, is that opinion? I, I couldn't tell. <laughs> I, I will caveat. I'll caveat what I say next with uh, I have. I, I'm pretty sure I've never even played a game of Flesh and Blood. I do have two unopened starter decks in my living room mm-hmm. one day. Uh, but. And I've looked into it a little bit. Like, I roughly understand what the game is, which, from my perspective, is basically it's like c- Commander with, like, you, you battle on the stack. Um, it's like, va- to put it's it in, like really quick short terms. It's like Vanguard, that old um, magic format. Yeah, it. sure. Yeah. Yes. Uh, so, cool. Uh, that, that's roughly, I, I roughly know what the game is about. I will say, I do think they have, that that game, from my perspective, which is a pure outsider who just incidentally observes the game from time to time, uh, it does seem to me to have followed a very similar progression to uh, the uh, versus TCG, which was fam- famously a card game that came out uh, developed by a lot of very strong Magic professional players. Really complex game, rewarded skill very highly, uh, very fun uh, as well. But the variance in that game was so small. If you were bad at versus, like if you if you were worse than your opponent, you were very very likely to lose to that person. It was so so likely i actually quit versus very early on in its life cycle because uh i played you know like four tournaments or whatever i even won one or two of them uh just local events or whatever but there were people i was playing against 
And I was seeing like, oh my God, like these people are just so much better than me at this game. Like it is mind boggling. And I can just go back to playing magic and hope those people get mana screwed. Um, so <laughs> yes, <laughs> that's, I, I think that's like, a, that was a legitimate yeah. problem with the versus TCG was that it had, a, it started off with this very strong audience. And it's really popular. And it was also a game of card game, uh, you know, using comics, comics are a great IP. Uh, so the, it, but over time, yeah, like if you keep going to the tournament every week and you keep losing, like ev- even people who aren't that invested in winning, that's going to diminish their ability to have fun. Uh, and I think that it's especially a common thing you see in games developed by like the people who come from like really competitive uh, TCG backgrounds. Uh, so, yeah, it, it's symptom. It's. A, a natural kind of consequence of like you could really easily fall into that. Uh, certainly, like that's something I think about myself uh, in designing games. Like I, I have to make sure that I don't let myself fall into that. Like a good example is actually Phoenix Force. Like Phoenix Force is one of my favorite cards in the game. Uh, it was a pretty like risky design to make uh, in a, in that sense for Snap, especially get considering the position as a season pass card because it is so complex uh, and really doing something kind of special and novel and, and odd. Uh, so there was, you know, a real risk that it might not find the audience that we usually hope for with a card. Uh, and that's the sort of thing that I think is easy to bump into, uh, when you don't kind of check yourself and be like, you know, who is this for? Again, I don't really know what, what, what flesh and blood's design process is like, or really who even is all involved in designing it. I do know it's people who really liked magic and the pro tour, like you know, I, they named their pro tour pro tour. So I, I totally get it. <laughs> Uh, and I'm very familiar with game cultures that have like had that kind of a vibe. Like I worked for the World of Warcraft TCG for a while and played it competitively. And so many of the players of that game were just lapsed Magic players who had you know come here and they they were very competitive in their day. Even if they weren't like pro tour players, they were the people who went to PTQs, right? Like they weren't the people who went to Friday Night Magic, like that were showing up at the big events. Um, and so yeah, th- those games you have to be careful about where you put your variance. How much you reward skill is the keeping the game fun and interesting for everyone is a key part to keeping your audience really healthy and lively. Um, which I actually, to Rune Terra's credit, I kind of disagree a little bit with KM, which is I do think Rune Terra was a game that rewarded skill uh, quite a lot, but I also think it was a game that really did good at appealing to, did well, I should say, geez, uh, at appealing to more casual players with a lot of the elements of it. Like the character leveling thing is like a super exciting story to achieve in your games. The animations were amazing. Like the, those moments, like those, those are things like the pro tour player isn't watching Fiora pull her sword out and like stab the screen. Like that's for somebody else. And they were really attentive to making sure that those players had lots of moments to feel seen and realized and excited about what was going on in their games. Um, in a way, the character level system is like our snap system. It's this way to give people a win inside of the game that isn't necessarily winning the game. Yeah. That's interesting. I, I will say the character level system was like not necessarily a negative for me, but it definitely wasn't a positive on that level. Which right. could impact how I was talking about it, right? Uh, I do want to dive in on something because it. I think someone could have listened to that conversation and come to the conclusion that you two agree. But I feel like you were posing pretty diametrically opposed viewpoints there because... Glenn, it feels like you were saying, I think Flesh and Blood could use more RNG. And Brendan, it feels oh, that, like you were saying... That's what I think, too, actually. I, that's, <laughs> that's what you think? I don't think it could use... That is not the impression. Well, it's not necessarily RNG. I think it needs to... So, it, it's, yeah. so it's in an interesting space. It needs to appeal to that player group. Yes. And one of the ways right. games commonly do that is by adding RNG so that that player group wins more often. And, but uh, it's not the only way. My, I just, my just, point yeah. was uh, the transitionary period or cycle is really tough sure. for them because their game okay. is propped up by the ultra competitive audience. Yeah. So there's like the... I think the Eldorado, like the place you want to go, like the the old, like where t- it wants to be in terms of design, is a very approachable game for casual players that maybe has something like a multiplayer format, and like that is the that's going to be the foundation, that's the support of the game, like that's how they'll be sustainable and successful in a long period of time. But to get there, it's really tough because you have to go through this period of making the game appeal to that audience while simultaneously not disenfranchising your current audience too much to an extent that your game potentially die, dies in the transition, which is, it, it's a tough spot. I empathize with it, but um, it is very interesting yeah. to witness as an enfranchised player that, that is watching this happen. Okay. Because I just assumed yeah. you were like, when you when you said that second bit at the end about like, you know, disenfranchising the enfranchised players, I assumed you were like, that's me. No. I'm being disenfranchised. No, no, I, I, so I, you don't understand. So like, I've, um, I've, I'm just I'm just giving our audience uh I'm just it's giving our audience ammo at this point. But uh so I mean, I, the 
Go ahead. Um, what were you you can also, an, another way to look at this is uh, that I think is kind of interesting as a counter example uh, is actually like chess. So like chess is kind yeah. of in the middle of a bit of a boom right now, right? Um, but if you're so if you're a chess streamer like ten years ago or whatever, what were you doing to get views? Right, like you're probably just playing really good chess and trying to pair against really strong opponents and show really great games. And we've progressed now to what are people doing? Like if uh, I'll pick a rant, like I don't know. It, yeah, if Gotham Chess wants to like have more views, and he does very well, I'm sure he doesn't need them. Uh, but if he was just like, I want to release an episode that's going to have like you know 10 percent more views, like yeah, like he might try and get like Magnus Carlson to come and join him. Like that that works, but it only works so many times. Uh, but what's he going to actually like the real things that he can turn to or like, how can I make this gameplay like different and interesting? What if I like, you know, put myself on some absurd clock or I let my cousin take some of my turns who has never played chess. Like those are the kinds of things that chesters like actually do now is they put these like bananas constraints on themselves to make the games more entertaining and appeal to an audience that is maybe not sophisticated enough to appreciate, you know, how badly Magnus would beat Gotham if they happen to play. Like, that's not right. a super important thing. They don't even need to watch that game, really. But they would love to see, you know, what if Magnus got hammered and then played Gotham? That's a game they would right. love to see. So that's a way you can do... It's not exactly the same as, like, what if we, you know, randomly destroyed a pawn every turn, which is the kind of variance uh, that maybe CCGs would rely on. But it's a good example of, like, yeah, like, there's this, like, kind of spectatorship to gaming that is becoming more and more important. Uh, and you have to make sure you don't lose it alongside making your game really fun and rewarding because winning is great feedback. Your players should be feel very rewarded when they win, like that it was about their decisions, but they should also feel like playing the game is just fun. Like, I just want to do that. Dude, that's yeah. a, that's an excellent point. You're right. Spectatorship is important to a game. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I assume you know where I'm going with this. I, uh, before we get into that, because I know that that is a top, that is a topic for us. I do want to put something in perspective for Cam because it's really funny. So I played, Flesh and blood from from its inception. I played very competitively, and from my from my from the top of my mountain or my ivory tower, I would happily scream that Flesh and Blood was the best card game system. Everything else sure. was wrong. Everything else was just ancient. Modern day, twenty twenty four, Pro Tour Los Angeles. I'm sitting across from my opponent that is a renowned Pro Tour champion or something like that. I wish they would get mana screwed. I wish that was possible, bro. I'm not gonna <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah, it's like I, I saw a tweet from a buddy of mine who's a pro Magic player. And he was like, you know, I used to think I didn't care about variants in this game. Uh, and then I remembered that I sit here in front of my screen yelling for my opponent to mulligan and get mana screwed. <laughs> and it's just like, yeah, man, I feel you. <laughs> I feel that. I want those free wins, too. But this is like my anti-player diatribe, right? What I want is for you to get mana screwed. I don't want me to get mana screwed. Are you kidding me? Get the fuck out of here. <laughs> That's terrible. That's fair. Um, yeah. Spectator mode. Uh, if you can't talk about it, you can't talk about it. It's totally. It's. It, we totally understand. But yeah, it's. It's. Uh, it's honestly like not really in my purview at all. Like, I, if if you told if you told me someone at the company was like working on it last week, I would really just have not even really known unless I was actively trying to figure out if that was true. Um, so yeah, I can't. I can't really comment on it at all. Certainly, I can't. You know, generally speaking, on features like if it would make the game a cooler game to play and more accessible like that's a feature that you know we're not trying to avoid positive features uh, but we can only make so many features uh at a time like it's a huge undertaking to add a feature to the game uh with especially like you know we are we're a smallish team so yeah that's really all i can say about it is that you know even the greatest idea that we might have for a feature won't be in the game next month because just because of the realities of uh feature development in the spirit of going off script and asking potentially inappropriate questions, I would like to say if Marvel <laughs> Snap has not happened, <laughs> if Marvel Snap <laughs> would have another game mode in the future, can you give us any hints on potential paths that you're exploring? Like, are we looking at something like limited? Is another constructed format? Like, the smallest tidbit, maybe. Can't really give you anything. <laughs> <laughs> I like how you took the shot, right? You got a swing. Yeah. This is your Adam Warlock to he five. He did four mention that they were the Adam were Warlock to it. five four. Yeah. If I if I'd been prepped, maybe I could have come up with like a spoiler that I was like, "This is really safe," and maybe ask marketing. <laughs> but yeah, I just off the top of my head, I'm like, eh, I can't really commit to anything. Yeah. It's 
Yeah. We're, we're um, excited for it, to say the least. Um, but let's go back into our listener question section because uh, we went on a. F- I mean, we basically did a whole entire flesh and blood you podcast. You gave there. me explicit <laughs> permission to do this, Brendan. You can't just be like, oh, KM, feel free to jump in and go wherever your brain takes you and then be like, oh, damn, it's an hour and a half later. Nice job, KM, you idiot. The next one is from <laughs> Fef XR. They say, do you guys look at how often someone retreats immediately after location reveals? For example, the peak reveal, someone retreats 60% of the time, every time. If so, which locations uh, suck the most based on those metric? Or I guess, which location? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah we, we, don't, we don't really look at that. Um, it's not... I'm trying to think of it. So... One of the things that, especially, uh, you know, Johnny, Timmy, Mary Spike is really about is that players may take similar behaviors, but for totally different reasons. Uh, so that's one of the reasons that, like, a data point like that, where, like, just, you know, do people re- do the same thing in the spot? There's, like, so much noise in the data mm-hmm. that we can't really draw a ton of great conclusions from it. Uh, plus, we do want, like, at, at its base level, like, locations are our mana screw. We expect some games to end that way. Uh, like, that's just how it goes. Uh, so it is a meaningful part of the gameplay that we want to retain. Um, to give, give an example of like the noise thing, like let's say I asked uh, Brendan and KM to rate like 100 cards or something, uh, and then we pick a card at, at random out of the mix. KM rated it a seven. Uh, Brendan rated it a seven. All right, they both think the cards a seven. They agree with one another, right? Well, what if Brendan's average rating for a card is an eight, and KM's average rating for a card is a five? Brendan doesn't like the card. Cam thinks it's quite great. Like that's the numbers are just don't matter. Like even though they did the exact same behavior, right. there's a bunch of added context that changes what you might take away from the actual behavior. So that's the sort of thing. Like you can maybe suss that out. Like I'm not saying you couldn't try and figure out if you really wanted to for locations. Um, but there's just the more and more stuff you have to like scrape off of the data. The smaller and smaller your sample gets to the point of like maybe you're not even getting something great at this point because you also might just have not scraped something else important and now you have a very small sample that's contaminated even more larger, uh, even more largely based on a, a bias. So, yeah. It's just not a super fruitful path, even though I understand the how sim- how simple it might seem. We're like, yeah, people don't want to play with the location. Maybe they should get rid of that I location. That a lot. Yeah, because like, it is a thing that like gets thrown out there. I-, I can think of at least two streamers who have suggested this like, hey, why doesn't Second Dinner look at how many people quit after Thing? And usually I think Thing is Galactus, but I'm not specifically mm-hmm. sure. But like, I've definitely like yeah, I've yeah. watched multiple streamers pitch that, and I've been like, oh yeah, that sounds right. And I never really thought about it beyond that. And it was just like, oh yeah, they probably should look into that. And I'm like, oh yeah, that, that, that's a good point. That There are probably a lot of reasons why that doesn't make sense. Yeah, that, like, it is reasonable. Like, I'm not saying it's not. Yeah, I think we could learn, we could learn things from that. But it is just really a lot more muddled than people tend. People tend to think of it as like a really simple data point. Uh, and it's really not like, you know, what if half of those peak retreaters that had already played for an hour and the other half were just like starting their day? Like, that's totally different. You know? Yeah. Very different like, reasons I, they might think, be wanting to Yeah. And I think like specifically in the case of something like Galactus or the peak, it'll just tell you what you already know, which is like, that's a high variance location yep. that can instantly yep. win or lose the game. <laughs> it's like, oh, yeah, well, we kind of do that. That's what it says. Yeah, and that, that's certainly an argument, like maybe some locations should be more or less rare. And we did change the rarity of some locations recently in part to line things up a little bit better with the amount of impact they had versus uh, their frequency. So we, we do pay attention to it in that regard. But yeah, like we, you know, you are supposed to retreat from some locations appearing, like that's how it goes. I often find like I, if, the, if the peak did not ruin my hand, I snap almost immediately 100% of the time. So right, I think in some ways that one's... Yeah. It's like a position game. Like whoever's first to snap is going to win this game. We're both screwed. Like, let's just go. Like, yeah. Uh, there's the other one, though, where it's like, I, I swear to, I, like, I'm fairly certain that you said you would rather just adjust a deck than adjust locations around the deck. Yeah. I'm fairly certain you said that. What caused you to deviate from that with the destroy locations? I like any like anything. It's just a general truth. Like you know, there are no one hundred percent. I actually like I, I teach a course. Well, I mean, for destroy specifically, yeah. uh, we just had uh, added a lot of them. Like what what I actually did was I looked. Uh, I generated what was the frequency for. Well, I, this is actually quite exhaustive. What wound up happening, but I don't mind diving into it. Uh, so I took all the locations that were live when the game released. Okay. And I figured out how often they each showed up, and I tagged them with like you know which decks and did they help which uh effects did they offer like did a card did add a card to the game like etc etc so i did all of that for every location uh that and then i did it for all the other locations that we've had now 
And then I compared the percentages to see how much things had changed. And gotcha. we had substantially increased the percentage of fre- the percentage appearance frequency uh, for locations that favored destroy uh, more so than any other category. So I was like, okay, so we've actually we actually have made too many. If we were if our goal was to keep everything the same, that's I know our goal isn't explicitly to keep everything the same. But I'm using the start of the release essentially as like a control. Like we know that was a time that worked pretty well, that was pretty fun, and we had specifically the people who came before me on the team uh, had a rough idea of how locations should maybe favor different decks. Uh, so I'm fine to deviate from that. I'm not saying we want to like always be exactly that. Uh, but there was like enough of a deviation that I was like, yeah, we can fairly easily correct this uh, without really even damaging anyone's experience. Like we put that in the patch notes about like the, that location frequency, but I highly doubt anyone even like consciously observes it. Uh, it's just, you know, a, a, a very small change overall to any of those given locations were appearing at a frequency of like, I don't know, like one and a half percent or something. And maybe some of them are now like 1.3 percent. So like as an in aggregate, it's such a small change. It's just not very noticeable, but it was there was no real downside on our end to correct it. So the fascinating thing about you describing your what you've done there is I have done the same thing, but for figuring out if it was beneficial to play on unrevealed locations with specific yes. subsets yeah. of cards. I have That I is have, one of the I categories have, that I tagged locations yes. for as well. Yeah. I have a doc. <laughs> like that's like with that's also X, a, it's yeah. That's actually a really interesting one because that's something I actually do think we want to increase a little bit. Uh like that's a number that I'm happy to raise because it is we like adding variants to the game. Like we want there to be fun, healthy variants and playing on an unrevealed location and it being awesome for you is a super rewarding feeling. That's way better than getting mana screwed, but it accomplishes very similar dynamics in the game and that it will maybe punish you and you'll lose or it will maybe let you win a game you otherwise maybe shouldn't have uh so it's a really fun way to add a a similar uh dynamic i think one of the things i really noticed when i was doing that is like just like a lot of the upsides to playing on unrevealed locations is just like one of the things will flip up that your opponent can't play there right (laughs) it's like i I, that's a frequency that's important to maintain as like a really really similar line yeah Right. But it's like if you're designing, I mean, you are a designer, right? you are doing this, presumably, if you're looking for a new location and you're thinking, I'd like to increase the variance in such a way that does not increase the amount of locations that say you can't play here. I'd imagine that's actually like a fairly constricted design space. So I'm interested to see what you come up with. Well, I mean, I, I make a lot of locations like that that you maybe don't think of that way. Uh, hmm. Like. Aunt Maze is a good example. Like that's a location where like you can you can just play on Aunt Maze, but maybe you shouldn't right now. Maybe you want to wait. Yeah. Like there might be a really important reason to wait. Um, that's the space I really like to do for restrictive locations is creating like when should I play on it or what should I play on it? Not I cannot can or cannot play on it. Uh, yes. The black the black vortex is another good example of that. Like do I want to play on it early and figure out what my six is, or do I want to keep that secret for my opponent longer so that they don't know what might happen there? Uh, and that kind of stuff like that. Those are the ways that I like to really emphasize designing restrictive locations uh, because I do think it's fun. And some of them do or don't pay off like black vortex is an example of like playing on black vortex blind is like not explicitly bad, but it's not good. Like it's just, a, it's just a thing that you can do that will slightly change what happens in the game. Maybe. Um, whereas I don't know, like Krakoa is a good like Krakoa playing on Krakoa blind is actually probably great because now you didn't blow your Krakoa proc on a weaker card. You have it for later. And that's a really subtle difference, but it's, it matters and adds context and makes the game much more interesting to have such a rich range of things that can occur. This next question is maybe a bit of a stretch only because it involves what could potentially be private data. It's not inappropriate at all. It comes from Has Banana. They say, do we see the snap equivalent of old Hearthstone stereotype that Americans play aggressive face hunter decks and Europeans play control mage decks? Do we see anything like that, like um, region-based uh, preferences? In um, the snap? Yeah, I have looked into this on occasion, but I don't look into it regularly enough that I'm like, up to date on what the differences are. Occasionally I, I have observed like minor differences in archetype spreads. Uh, I, I think if I recall at one point I looked in like Thanos was meaningfully more popular uh, in the Asian region. At I one was point. about to suggest but, that like they, they were yeah. Thanos one tricks for like two months into being into Loki being the best deck. It was still all Thanos on Asia. They are my favorite server. I love <laughs> them so much. Like, like when they find a deck, it is like, like they are, it is all Thanos and then it is all Loki. And like, I, they're easily my favorite server. They, they rule so hard. 
It's pretty funny because I remember watching Lambie, um, and he he plays on the Apex server. And I remember yeah. someone was talking about the diversity of decks they were facing in North America on High Ladder. They, <laughs> they, they, were, they were irritated about it, and Lambie was just like, "I literally only play against Thanos." Yeah, like, I, what are you talking yeah. about? <laughs> <laughs> the Asia server is the one that's like just anecdotally I have noticed is notably different from the other servers. Yeah. And yeah, for sure. All right. Next one is from Martla. They say if Luke Cage, Elsa and Mobius were set to three cost because they have a board wide effect, then why is Cosmo still a three cost and not a two cost like Shadow King, Goose Kingpin who only affect one lane? Sure. Uh, like Cosmo's dif- fairly different. Like, I mean, I don't know. Like the, the, the like, a trite answer is like they're different uh but cosmos <laughs> uh cosmo affects a really wide range of the cards that see play in general like you know you can play there are tons of decks against whom luke cage is cyclops uh but there are almost no decks against whom cosmo is a 3-3 with no text uh like the on reveal is just such a common uh keyword in our game so cosmo has a ton more potential impact uh he can you know snipe effects and deny them without your opponent having known they should play around him like luke again luke cage is similar like if you play luke cage ahead of a spider woman like yeah you caught him but if you had played it after that's the same like you you had luke cage it, it, the interaction is not very different but cosmo has a lot more dynamism in that regard so it can both be weaker and stronger uh, but really, the larger part of that answer is that Cosmo is a card that we make available really early on in the game, um, and he's not a card that necessarily, like, there are players who will they, they will feel very strongly about him. Co- Cosmo can be a very polarizing card if you're new to the game. Uh, like, getting your feeling like you're locked out of a location for your on reveal cards can just be really frustrating. So it's a card we have to be careful about when we ma- want to manage its strength. Uh, do I think Cosmo could be stronger? Probably. Yeah, like probably, uh, but two costs seems like it would be quite a bit much, uh, especially for that new player experience where they might just really, really dislike how frequently they would see Cosmo if, if the card was that strong. Mm-hmm. I think we should take this question the other way. Let's make Cosmo three cost and global. <laughs> global? Yeah, that, that would go great. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I think like you could do like super giants kind of like the range of that effect that I could see you do or like it's like next next turn on reveals don't fire is like a fine space but yeah I I wouldn't expect to see global cosmo anytime soon that that makes perfect sense uh, other global effects are three that's totally the same thing (laughs) it's coming from the guy who said hire me I'll do it for free I will I will (laughs) I will make cosmo global Global for free Glenn All right, next that one. That one's pretty easy. I believe it. Yeah. yeah, I could do it. I bet I could. Next is from Nof Pop, and they say, What is the most unusual or unexpected use of a card you've seen? What is a card that had a much bigger bigger or smaller impact on the game than expected? Um I mean, blob, we already talked about Blob. I think Blob's a, a good example for that. Uh didn't didn't really see exactly how big that was gonna go, even though we thought it was gonna be pretty good. Uh, as for unusual, I'm sure there are better ones than this, but the one, one that always really charmed me was I remember there was an old wave deck that was based around trying to get eight energy on the last turn to play Modok and Hulse at the same time. And I always thought that was just super charming and fairly clearly not what you're supposed to be doing with wave uh, then or now. Uh, but uh, well, maybe more so now. Now it's probably actually a much more reasonable line. Um, but it was, yeah, just a really cool, like, oh, yeah, you can actually use wave as like this, not just like a pseudo ramp, but it's like a, a interesting way to like kind of break the symmetry on each player can only play one card if you can get to eight energy. Mm-hmm. That was in a Thanos deck at one point. I, a Korean player, I believe it was Johnson, who was doing like mm-hmm. long Psylocke wave time zones. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like it was, a, it was, uh, I will describe it as intricate and I will use it as a synonym <laughs> for easily disrupted, <laughs> but it, it worked when it worked. All right. Yeah, but that's, it's cool. Uh, last question is from Henry. They say, question for Glenn. I think you've said seven cost cards are a win and not an if, along uh, with cards that interact with the snap mechanic. Um, I believe that, yeah, that, that is the question, I think. So mm-hmm. they also said, how do you decide uh, what ideas for new archetypes are worth pursuing and how long do you explore these ideas? Have there been ideas such archetypes you've explored that ultimately were not fun or competitive enough? Yeah, I think we talked earlier in the podcast a lot about kind of our process for doing that, which is really, you know, we start with going through a lot of the design space that a card inspires us to attack. And sometimes we won't necessarily be trying to design for the card, like we're just trying to come up with cool ideas. And when we come up with a cool idea, we also keep that like, you know, in a file where we're like, 
this seems rad. Like I would love to staple this onto a card one day. Uh, and we eventually find the right home for it. Uh, I think Mobius actually was such a card where we had that effect written down for a while until we were like, what would a cop feel like in our game? Oh, maybe this. <laughs> um, a cab includes Mobius, apparently. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, like someone, he was, not a cop is probably the right word, but he was about rules. Uh, like that was, sure. especially like we watched the Loki show and saw like him and Rabona's dynamic was very much like he was, uh, and Loki's, like he's a rule follower. Uh, and even though he, you know, breaks them a little bit to bring on Loki. Uh, but that was just like a key part of kind of the dynamic was like, what's allowed, what's not allowed. And uh, Ravona and Mobius both had that going on in hindsight. Now that we've like more fully seen it, it's like, oh, maybe Ravona would have been a better fit for Mobius flavor, but that's a whole, I think that's thing. actually probably true. Um, yeah, I think so. Too. Yeah. Uh, but now yeah, what can you do? Uh, uh, so yeah, seven that's cards. a lot. That's a lot of it. Yeah. The seven cost cards. I mean, we're, we're we are going to make them. That's the, I think that's, definitely a win for what it's worth when i say win, not if i really am usually just like that's my opinion like it, it definitely it may not actually happen um but that's my assessment of how likely it is um uh, but things things sometimes change you know yeah um i guess this last kind of lastly for me uh i will say it is hard to go back to other card games after playing snap with the snap mechanic i think dynamically increasing <laughs> increasing stakes just feels synonymous to playing cards with me at this point. Like it feels weird to not be able to dynamically increase stakes. Yeah. Um, it feels almost ancient and it, it, yeah, it's just, it's, 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 it's super interesting. I, I'm really, I'm keen to see how card games evolve off the back of snap and how successful it's been with that mechanic. I know it originated from backgammon. I'm pretty sure. So obviously it's not, it's not fundamentally new, but how it interacts with TCGs, CCGs is just fascinating to me. The last thing I want to ask you is you know, now that we're coming back to you for, for part two and you've been working at second dinner for as long as you have, do you have sort of like one key lesson learned that you, th maybe it's like universally applicable, but like, what is, what is one of your biggest takeaways from your experience at second dinner and working on marvel snap oh that's a tough question um i mean there's been many many takeaways in general uh like it's been a real learning one of the reasons i came to second dinner from wizards was i felt there was a lot of stuff i could learn from both the people at this company in specific uh as well as the role of like leading the design of a digital mobile game like those are just two two things that i was really excited to have the opportunity to access uh, like I, I didn't leave Magic because I didn't like working there. Like, it, was, I th it was a wonderful place to work for me, so it was a really tough decision. But I was excited about the potential of all the things I could learn. So that's part of why this question's hard. Is there are so many things that theoretically you could throw uh, in here that it's hard to even think of one. Mm. Um, I mean, certainly, like we talked about, pro like, I've very much come to appreciate process more and more. Uh, always very good. Uh, I think just oh, being. Uh, a little bit more open, like specifically welcoming people kind of like into uh, my workspace and making sure like, I, you know, if someone has a, an idea for a card design, uh, I want them to feel like they can just text, like send me, we, we, you know, use Slack. I want to feel like they can just message me and that they should feel totally comfortable doing that. Um, and, you know, maybe we'll use, maybe we don't, but it's even deeper than that. Like if they want to be like, hey, why, why did you do this? You know, like something they don't agree with. I also want them to feel really comfortable to talk to me about that. So. Um, I try and really focus on maintaining uh, a very open kind of culture around the design team specifically. And I, I think that we do that fairly successfully. Um, you know, we try and make play tests fun. That's one of the reasons, like, I, this is a random thing that just nobody else knows except for people running around. But for every play test, I give, like, all of the play test decks silly names. Uh, and never, I try to never repeat one. Um, but that's just, examples? like, a thing, a thing that we do. Uh, sure. Let me think about, cause I have to go back in t time to find, uh, one that's like not released since those are the ones I've been doing <laughs> more regularly. Sure. Um, uh, like cult. Yeah, this is a really dumb one, but yeah, cult sitting. I think we did call me maybe for example, was one oh. of the deck names. So oh. yeah, it's just, it's just nothing but that, like the whole way down and every now and then I, I think there's like a genuinely pretty good one. Um, but <laughs> mostly it's just whatever pun I could think of for the card, uh, in the moment and then go. <laughs> Yeah, I just I was having visions of KM um, working an unpaid internship at second dinner, slacking oh, after yeah. one too many cups of yeah. coffee, and just saying, "Cosmo Global Effect?" Question mark. I could actually, I could actually, if you if you want to pick a card, I bet I could find one uh, okay. to play a little game with it because uh, I can search the forum for it real quick. Yeah, give, give me, give me, give me, give me Mockingbird. Mockingbird. Okay, well, that's gonna take a minute. Da, 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 da. 
I'm I'm just I'm just like drunk drunk texting Glenn <laughs> like all the worst ideas you've ever heard. <laughs> <laughs> just, just, so hear me out. Just it's, it's uh, gonna it's gonna feel like a no initially, but I want you to sleep on. <laughs> Just really testing the limits yeah. of the open door policy. <laughs> That's what I was well, like. Well, it's really more man. for internal employees. So. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I like it because like, if you didn't specify for the design team at the end of that, I was going to make a joke where it was like, oh, sure. you heard That's him. Everyone send him your, everyone yeah. send Glenn all your ideas. He wants it to be an open environment. Uh, to clone a mockingbird was one of mockingbird's deck names. Uh, it was a okay, moon girl so mockingbird. Moon girl. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. I'm with it. Okay, sure. Awesome. Any we're particularly proud of in in there? They like none, none that stick in my brain. It? Like, okay, yeah, they they just fly through. There are like some very recent ones where I thought they were super funny, but like you know, you can't tell three us. months from now, I won't remember okay. them anyway. So <laughs> it's not okay. That's just how it goes. I'm sure there were funny ones uh, from recent cards. I just have no longer remember. Glenn, I have a general TCG question to ask you. Um right now to detract slightly but i listened to a podcast recently with richard garfield and he talked about the original ideation for magic the constructive format and he said that a card game faces um a paradigm uh then they have they must choose one they must either rotate or power creep do you think that that's a fundamental truth for a card game i think that the evidence thus far indicates thus i don't believe that it is a fundamental truth um I, I like Richard. Richard's great. Uh, but I, I do like personally as a, a designer, like one of the things I really try and uh, avoid is like boxing myself into an assumption because I'll never get out if I do it uh, that way. And maybe sometimes I'll waste a bunch of time. Like who knows? Maybe I'll wind up spending like, you know, two years trying to avoid rotating snap cards. And then we just rotate some snap cards like that. That could theoretically happen. We're not really paying attention to it right now. Um, but that's like kind of my, my vibe on it is I, I really, I know there are things that we know work that other games have used that work that have pros and have cons uh, and, you know, exploring what we could do that might be different is just my natural inclination. And that lines up really well with the values I think of second dinner uh, as a company. So that's one of the reasons I think it's a, a great place to work. Yeah. yeah. I feel like y'all are able to break the paradigm uh, quite a bit because you're able to dynamically adjust cards so frequently, whether it's OTAs, it's patches. I mean, like, I mean, your old cards can just become new cards. Like, it is a very unique place to be in. I do see a lot of new TCGs coming to market that are very ambitious with this, this value prop because I think a lot of players were disenfranchised off of something like a standard rotating format in Magic the Gathering, and then these new TCGs will come out and they'll just be like, no rotation eternal and it's very very common and i don't think that people understand the baggage and the weight that that comes with yeah. in terms of design because it is like i do th at this point for a physical dcg i do think that yes you get close to you must either power creep or rotate but players because they've been promised something are super hesitant to embrace any form of rotation i mean flesh and blood has navigated it amazingly because they've added rotation to the game but it is uh yeah it's kind of sneaky right like things like living legend out you know, call it rotation yeah so, that mechanic I, I, is very interesting i'm not sure where i come down on it um i come down from a from a revenue standpoint i do i come down fairly negatively but i don't know from a gameplay standpoint it seems like it might actually be pretty good like for, it certainly is like a brew positive mechanic right like if you are a brewer avoiding the top deck is going to naturally insulate you from ever experiencing rotation so that's cool like that rewards brewing um yeah it does lead to some funny questions because uh so i do do content for the game people will come and ask me like oh i'm new to the game what deck should i buy and it's like oof that's tough. The, the third best one. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> tier deck, C tier deck. Like, what are we looking for here? Anyway, uh, Cam, I just want to give you a chance to ask any final questions you have for Glenn before we close out. I've just spent two hours going in. Like, <laughs> I, I'm good. I like. I I'm questioned out. Whoa. Awesome. Well, Glenn, didn't think you'd hear that, yeah. did you? No. I, I yeah. <laughs> Uh, Glenn, we really appreciate you coming on. It's it's awesome to have you at sort of the head of the wheel over there for you know, as the principal game designer. Like we have, you inspire a lot of faith uh, faith with me and KM, and I know with the the larger the larger community as well. And when you come on these podcasts, it is awesome to be able to peek behind the curtain um, and get your sort of get your thoughts. Like I, I, we really appreciate you coming on. I want to give you a chance to shout out anything you want to. I know um, <laughs> that might sound kind of weird, but if you want to shout out where people can find you or what you're up to, or just anything they should look forward to. Uh, oh yeah. I'm sure. around. Uh, play, play Marvel snaps. Pretty dope game. Uh, <laughs> um, 
look at looking forward to a lot of the stuff we are releasing later this year. I think it will be cool. And uh, we're cooking up more stuff than that uh, as well. So yeah, I think there's a lot of exciting times on the future for snap and second dinner. So we're very, very interested to see where things will go over the next couple of years. Awesome. Well, once again, for the last time from Cam and I, and I know our <laughs> community, thank you. Like, thank you for giving our time, giving you our time, yeah, thank you for coming on the podcast. Anyway, if you want to say thank you and you listen to this podcast, you enjoy it. The number one thing you can do is leave a review <laughs> on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. It helps so, 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 so much. The video version of this on YouTube at youtube.com slash at the underscore snapshot. Hit subscribe right there. Brendan APG, Cam Best MS, at Glenn under, underscore Jones underscore Cam is streaming. Not on hot sometimes, locations. Not I don't even time. know. <laughs> like, I, I, I also wanted to say when you did that outro there, like when you were like thanking Glenn for the final time, I thought you were doing the outro. So I winked at the camera and it's totally incongruous with what was actually going on there. <laughs> I just wanted to like, I feel like the only way to recover from that is to just throw a lampshade on it. So that's what I'm doing. Um, <laughs> yeah, I stream sometimes. What's weird is I feel like I've become a YouTuber who streams and it used to be the other way around. But now it's like there's mm. a YouTube video every and i stream when i have the social energy to talk to 500 people and it's like i didn't i i didn't realize like there were days back in the early days i was streaming every day and i look back at that and i was like damn that guy was cool as hell <laughs> <laughs> we'll see we'll see we'll see we'll see we'll see i'm gonna try to get back into like some some more streaming uh starting with the new season hopefully because yeah. there are some crazy, crazy cards in there, which we didn't talk about at all. Actually, we totally beefed that. In the week a new season is coming out yeah. with the dev on here, we were like, oh, I yeah, did, let's I not did, ask any questions. I, about that. I knew we Great. would be stretched for time, but yeah, it is, good. It is, it is definitely a snapshot uh, tradition yeah. that we try to evaluate all the cards, and then we get to um acknowledge the ones we got right and then pretend we never talked about the ones we got wrong it's cool this just makes this podcast evergreen yeah. right there's it's not dated in any way there's no there's nothing dated about it it just makes it evergreen. well there you go yeah thank yeah. you all so much for listening thank you glenn for coming on we appreciate you all so much we'll see you next week properly timed wings <laughs>